في الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبع سنته إلى يوم الدين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We'd like to welcome you all here today ladies and gentlemen, honored guests and viewers of various satellite channels to this, the 12th Ramadan Forum with the slogan this year of loyalty and belonging and this year we're coming to you for the first time here in Dubai World Trade Center and now I will introduce you to today's speaker Dr. Zaka Naik a medical doctor by professional training Dr. Zaka Naik is renowned as a dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion Dr. Zaka Naik is the president of the Islamic Research Foundation in Mumbai he is popular for his critical analysis and convincing answers to the challenging questions posed by audiences after his public talks. In the last 17 years, he has conducted over 2,000 public talks all over the world. Dr. Zarkan Naik appears regularly on many international TV channels in more than 200 countries of the world. He is regularly invited for TV and radio interviews. More than 100 of his talks are available on DVDs and VCDs, and he has authored many books on Islam and comparative religion. He launched Peace TV English in January 2006, which is the largest watched Islamic as well as any religious satellite channel in the world. And with that, I hand over and invite Dr. Zakir Knight to the stage for his talk. Under the patronage of His Highness Sheikh Ahmed bin Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, Chairman of the Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum Foundation, the Department of Tourism and Commerce Marketing organizes the activities of the 12th Ramadan Forum from 3rd to 14th of Ramadan, 1434 Hijri, 12th to 23rd of July 2013 in Zabil Hall at the Dubai World Trade Center. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam. Al Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajmain. Amma baad. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Awalam yaral lazina kafiru. Anna samawati wal arda. Kaanu taratkan fitakna huma. Wajalna min al-maai kulla shayin hai. Afala yuminun. Rabbi shayli sadri. Wa yasilli amri. Wa halul uqdat min lisaani yafqa wakawli. My respected elders and my brothers and sisters. I welcome all of you. With the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to be invited for the second time in the Ramadan Forum organized by the Government of Tourism Dubai under the patronage of Sheikh Ahmed bin Muhammad bin Rashid al Maktoum. And it's a pleasure for me always to keep on coming to the city of Dubai. Dubai. The city of Dubai has become like my second home. The topic of this evening's talk of mine is Quran and modern science, compatible or incompatible. The glorious Quran is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was revealed to the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. For any book to claim that it is a message from Almighty God, for any book to claim that it is the word or revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it should pass the test of time. In the olden ages, it was the age of miracles. And the glorious Quran is the miracle of miracles. Later on came the age of literature and poetry. Muslim and non-Muslim Arabic scholars alike, they acclaim the glorious Quran to be the best Arabic literature available on the face of the earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a challenge in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 23 and 24, which says, Wa in kuntum fi mimma nazzalna ana abdina. And if you end out as what we have produced 
You are serving from time to time. Fatu bi surat al mimisli. Produce a surah somewhat similar to it. Wad ushoda akhu minun the law in kudum sadikin. And call forth your helpers and protectors. If there are any besides Allah, but if your doubts are true, fa illam tafalu. But if you cannot, walam tafalu. And of a surety cannot. Fatta kunnar al lati wa khudu al nasa wa lujara wa dhatil kafirin. Then prepare for the fire whose fuel is men and stones. For those who reject faith. This is a challenge given in the glorious Quran to the whole of humankind to try and produce a single surah somewhat similar to any of the surah of the glorious Quran. No one has been able to do it and no one will be able to do it. This is the standing challenge. That is the reason the glorious Quran is the best Arabic literature available on the face of the earth. But today, if a religious book in a very poetic fashion says that the world is flat, will a modern man believe in it? And the answer is no. Because today is not the age of literature and poetry. Today is the age of science and technology. So let us analyze today whether the glorious Quran is compatible or incompatible with modern science. According to the famous physicist and the Nobel Prize winner, Albert Einstein, he said that science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind. Let me repeat the statement of Albert Einstein, the famous physicist and Nobel Prize winner. He said that science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind. Let me remind you that the glorious Quran is not a book of science, S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E, but it's a book of signs, S-I-G-N-S. It's a book of ayats. And there are more than 6,000 ayats, more than 6,000 signs in the glorious Quran, out of which more than 1,000 speak about science. As far as my talk today is concerned, I will only be speaking about scientific facts which have been established. I will not be speaking about scientific theories and hypotheses, which all of us know very well, that many a times these theories and hypotheses, they take your turn. In the field of astronomy, there were a couple of scientists who described about 40 years back, how did the universe come into existence? And this they called as the Big Bang. And they said that initially our whole universe was one primary nebula. Then there was a secondary separation of the Big Bang, which gave rise to galaxies, gave rise to stars, sun, moon, and the planet on which we live. This they call as the Big Bang. What they discovered about 40 years back is already mentioned in the Quran 14 years ago. And I started my talk by quoting a verse of the Quran from, from, from Surah Ambiya. Chapter number 21, verse number 30, which says, Avalam yaral lazina kafiru. Do not the unbelievers see. And the samavati wal arda. Kanathrat kams taknauma. That the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. This big bang, what they came to know 40 years back, about the creation of the universe, is already mentioned in the Quran 14 years ago. Previously, we human beings, we thought that the world was flat. It was in 15. 77, when Sir Francis Drake sailed around the earth that he proved that the earth was spherical. The Quran says in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 29, Alam tara anna allaha yuliju layla fil nahari, yuliju nahara fil layli. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who merges the night into the day and merges the day into the night. This merging is a gradual and a slow process. The night gradually and slowly merges into the day, and the day gradually and slowly merges into the night. This gradual change of night into day and day into night is only possible if the earth is spherical. If it was flat, it would have been a sudden change. Furthermore, the Quran says in Surah Az Zumar, chapter number 39, verse number 5, that the day overlaps over the night. And the, and the night overlaps over the day. The Arabic word used here is kawara, which means to overlap. Like how you overlap a turban onto the head. 
the same way the night overlaps under the day and the day overlaps under the night. This is only possible if the shape of the earth is spherical. Furthermore, the Quran says in Surah Naziyat, chapter number 79, verse number 30, Wal ard baad azalika dhaha. And thereafter, we have made the earth X shaped. The Arabic word dhaha, one of its meaning is an expanse, and the earth is an expanse. The other meaning is derived from the Arabic word duya, which means an egg. And we know today that the world is not completely round like a ball, it is geospherical in shape. It is starting from the pole and bulging from the center. And the Arabic word duya doesn't refer to a normal egg, it specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich. And if we analyze the shape of the egg of an ostrich, that too is geospherical in shape. Imagine the glorious Quran describes the geospherical shape of the earth 1400 years back, which we came to know recently. Previously, we human beings, we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. It was recently, 200 years back, 300 years back, we came to know that the light of the moon is not its own light, but it's a reflected light of the sun. The Quran mentions in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61, Blessed is he who has placed the constellation in the sky, who has made the constellation in the sky, and placed the heron, sun, having its own light, and moon, having a reflection of light. The Arabic word used for the sun in the glorious Quran is shams, and its light is always described as siraj, bahaj, or diya, meaning a torch, blazing lamp, or a shining glory. The Arabic word for moon is kamar. Its light is always described as munir or nur, meaning borrowed light or reflected light. Nowhere in the Quran is the moonlight described as siraj, bahaj, or diya, meaning having its own light. It's always described as munir or nur, meaning borrowed light or reflection of light. And the same message is repeated in Surah Nu, chapter number 71, verse number 15 and 16, that the light of the moon is its own light, and the light of the sun is borrowed light. Previously, since the time of Ptolemy, in 2nd century BC, the scientists, they believe in a theory known as geocentrism. And they thought that the earth was the center of the universe, and all the other planets and the sun, they revolve around the earth. It was in 17th century, in 1622, that Copernicus, he said that it is not the earth which is the center of the universe, it is the sun which is center of the solar system. And it is not the sun which revolves around the earth, it is the earth and the other planets which revolve around the sun. And later on in 1609, Johannes Kepler wrote in his book called the Astronova Nova that not only do the planets revolve around the sun, but they also rotate about their own axis. And when I was in school, I had learned the same thing. But I had learned that the sun did not rotate about its own axis. The solar system revolved, but the sun did not rotate about its own axis, like the planets and the moon. But there's a verse in the Quran which I read when I was in school in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, which says, it's Allah who has created the night and the day. The sun and the moon. Each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. So the Quran says that the sun and the moon, besides revolving, it also rotates about its own axis. The Arabic word used is yes, bahun, derived from the Arabic word sabaha, which describes the motion of a moving body. When I use this Arabic word for a person on the floor, it will not mean he's rolling, it will mean he's running or walking. If I use this word for a person in water, it will not mean he is floating, it will mean he's swimming. Similarly, when the Quran uses this word, yes, bahun, for a celestial body, it doesn't mean it's flying, it means it's rotating about its own axis. So the Quran says, besides the moon, even the sun revolves as well as rotates about their own axis. And today, with the help of an equipment, we can have the image of the sun on a tabletop, and we see that the sun has got black spots. 
and these black spots take about 25 days to complete one rotation, indicating that the sun takes 25 days to complete one rotation. And now, this fact has been incorporated in all the books of the school, all the science textbooks. Imagine, in 1982, when I passed my 10th standard, I had learned that the sun did not rotate about seven axis, and Quran mentions 1400 years back that the sun rotates, and now, this fact is mentioned in all the textbooks of the school. The Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 32, that we have made the sky as a protected ceiling. Today science tells us that the atmosphere that is there above the earth, it acts like a protected ceiling and it prevents the harmful rays and radiation like x-rays and ultraviolet rays from entering the earth, without which life to exist on the earth would have been difficult. So Quran says we have made the sky as a protected ceiling. The Quran says in Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 34, that we, the sun is running its course to a place that a mind, for a period that a mind. The Arabic word used is mustakar, meaning to a place that a mind, for a period that a mind. And today science tells us that the sunlight we have is due to a chemical reaction which is taking place since billions of years. And one day this chemical reaction will cease and the sun will cease to exist and so will life on the face of the earth. So the scientists say that, that will take another billion years more. And today the science also tells us that the sun, along with the solar system, is, run, is going towards a point in the universe known as Alpha Lyra, point in the Hercules, at a speed of 12 miles per second. So the translation of the Arabic word mustakar for a period determined to a place determined. It's going to a place determined and it's also running for a period. So both these meanings are applicable what science had discovered today. When I was in school, I had learned that there are three states of matter, solid, liquid and gas. And I had learned that time that the space outside the organized astronomical places, it was vacuum. Outside the organized astronomical the space was called a vacuum. Today, after science has developed and advanced, we have come to know that there are interstellar matter that is present in between the organized astronomical systems. And this, today science calls as plasma. And which today science calls it as the fourth state of matter. And Quran says in Surah Furqan, Chapter number 25, verse number 59. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has created the heavens and the earth and everything in between. The Quran says Allah has created even things in between the heavens and the earth, which science previous considered as vacuum. But Quran says He has created things in between also, and today science has discovered and it calls these interstellar matter as plasma. It was in the 20th century that Edwin Hubble, he discovered that the universe is expanding, it's receding, and the universe is keeping on enlarging and expanding. And Quran says in Surah Dariyat, chapter 51, verse number 47, that we have created the vastness of space. That big word is Mu'suyuna, meaning the expanding, meaning the vast universe. So Quran says that the universe is expanding, which we came to know just recently. There may be many skeptics who will say, it's nothing great that the Quran speaks about astronomy, because the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy. I do agree with them that the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy, but I have to remind them, it was centuries after the Quran was revealed 
that the Arabs become advanced in the field of astronomy. So it's from the Quran that the Arabs learn about astronomy and not the vice versa. In the field of physics, there's a very famous theory called as theory of atomism, which was propounded by the Greeks, especially by a person by the name of Democritus. And this theory says that atom is the smallest part of matter. And this was known to the world and believed by the world that atom is the smallest part of matter which cannot be divided further. And even the Arabs believed in this. And the Arabic word used for atom is zarra. But today, after science advanced, we have come to know that though atom is the smallest particle of matter, having the characteristics of the element, it too can be divided into electrons, into protons. The Quran speaks about zarra, about the atom, and it says it is a smallest part. So people may think that the Quran is outdated after science advanced. In fact, if you read the Quran, it's mentioned in Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 3, that when they ask, that when will the hour come? Tell them, it will surely come with the permission of thy Lord, who has in his knowledge the smallest detail of an atom, and in whose record is propitious things smaller and greater than the atom. So Quran says, that in Allah's knowledge <coughs> is detail of the smallest part like an atom and in his record is clear things lesser and greater than the atom. So Quran says there are things which are lesser and greater than the atom which we came to know recently. And the same message repeated in Surah Yunus chapter number 10 verse number 61 that in Allah's record is propitious, clear. Things smaller and greater than the atom. So the Quran is not outdated, the Quran is up to date, Alhamdulillah. In the field of hydrology, we learned in school about the water cycle. What we learned in the school water cycle was first described by Sir Bernard Palissy in the year 1580. And what we learned in school that the water evaporates from the ocean, it rises, it forms into clouds, it moves into the interior, it falls down as rain, and then it forms lakes and streams which flow back into the ocean, and the water cycle is complete. Previously, we did not know about the water cycle. It was only described the first time in 1580. Previously, in 7th century, Tales of Meletus, he said that it is the spray of the ocean which is picked up by the winds which fall into the interior as rainwater. We did not know from where did the underground water come. People thought it was the pressure of the winds that was put on the ocean which forced the water into the interior. And people thought there was a secret passage which flowed back into the ocean at the time of Plato it was called as Tartarus. This was believed till as late as 17th century even by scientists like Descartes. And Aristotle, his theory was that the mountain caverns, it stored water which fed to springs. Today we come to know that the underground water is due to the seepage of the rainwater in cracks in the ground, which we came to know recently. Quran mentions in Surah Furqan, and Quran also mentions in Surah Az-Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 21, that fear thou not, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sends down water from the sky and leads it in cracks in ground and causes sown field of varying colors to grow. The Quran says that the underground water is due to the seepage of the rain water in cracks which we came to know recently. The Quran says in Surah Rum chapter number 30 verse number 24 that it is Allah who sends down water from the sky and causes and gives life to the dead, gives life to the earth after it is dead. Quran says in Surah Mu'minun chapter number 23 verse number 18 that it is Allah who sends the water from the sky and he is able to store the water and he is even able to drain it. Allah says in Surah Hijr chapter number 15 verse number 22 that we cause fecundating winds. The Arabic word used is lawaki coming from the word lakaha which means to fecundate. And today science tells us 
that the clouds, when the clouds when they gather, the pollen that's picked up by the air, they act as they go into the clouds, and because of which the you find that the rainwater comes, and the rainwater is also due to the joining of the clouds. So these two process is the reason how the water comes from the sky. The Quran says in Surah Room, chapter number 30, verse number 48, that is the microphone ready? Can I use it? Quran says, the Quran says in Surah Room, can you increase the volume of it? The Quran says in Surah Room, chapter number 30, verse number 48, that the clouds join together, they move into the interior, they fall down as rain, and the water cycle is replenished. The Quran speaks about, I think I'll just change my position there, it'll be better. The Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail in several places. The Quran says in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse 57. In Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 17. In Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 40 to 49. In Surah Fatih, chapter number 35, verse number 9. In Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 34. The Quran speaks of the water cycle in Surah Qaf, chapter number 50, verse number 8 and 9. In Surah Waqiyah, chapter number 56, verse number 67 to 70. The Quran speaks of water cycle. In Surah Mul, chapter number 67, verse number 30. In Surah Tariq, chapter number 3, verse number 11. In several places, the Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail. In the field of oceanology, the Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 53, that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who lets, who lets free two bodies of flowing water, one sweet and palatable, the other salt and bitter. Though they meet and mix, there is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. The Quran says in Surah Rahman, chapter 55, verse number 19 and 20, Marajal bahraniya taqiyan, bainam Allah bar zaqiyan, that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has led free two bodies of flowing water. Though they meet and mix, there is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. Previously, the commentators of the Quran, they could not understand what does the Quran mean by saying that the two types of water, salt and sweet, they meet and they mix, but there is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. It is contradicting. Today, after science advance, we have come to know that whenever one type of water flows into the other type of water, it loses its constituents and gets homogenized into the water it flows. This slanting barrier, which the Quran refers to as barzakh, today science tells as the transitional homogenizing area. So today science says that whenever one type of water flows into the other type of water, it loses its constituents and gets homogenized into the water it flows. So both these water, though they meet and they mix, they are distinct. Even the temperature between these two water differs. One is sweet and the other is salty. And this phenomena can be seen very well. If you go to Egypt, when River Nile flows into the Mediterranean Sea, and in South Africa, in the Cape Point, in the southernmost tip in Cape Town, where we see even the colors between these two waters differ. And the best example is the Gulf Stream. 
We start from the Gulf of Mexico, flows for thousands of miles, and both the waters are distinct. And if you're traveling in a boat and pick up water from one side and pick up water from the other side, one of the water is sweet, the other is salty. Even the temperature between these two waters differ. In the field of hydrology, the Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 40, that the unbelievers state is like the depths of the darkness in the dark sea the state of the unbelievers mind is like the depths of darkness in a vast deep ocean wave topped with wave topped with dark clouds when a man stretches his hand he can hardly see it for to whom Allah gives no light no light reaches him this verse of the Quran of Surah Nur chapter number 24 verse number 40 was shown to Prophet Durga Rao and he was asked to give his comments and he was shocked he said how could this verse which was revealed 20 which was revealed 1400 years ago could mention such scientific facts which you came to recently previously we human beings we did not know that the depths of the ocean were dark because a human being cannot go unaided underwater more than 20 to 30 meters and even with aid, it cannot go more than 200 meters, a human being. Only in 1900, when submarines were created and discovered, when they went underwater, they came to know that the depth of the ocean was dark. And even the fish, for them to see, they carry their own light. And how is this darkness? From the Durga Rao says, this darkness is for me to two main reasons. The first is, Whenever light enters into the water, the light, there is refraction of light. And the light rays are absorbed in layers. And we learned in school that the light contains of seven colors. That is vipgyor, violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. So when light enters the water, the first 15 to 20 meter, it absorbs the red color. That's the reason if a man dives underwater more than 25 meters and if he bleeds, he will not be able to see the red color of his blood because red color does not reach that part of the ocean. From 30 to 50 meters, the orange color is absorbed. From 50 to 100 meters, the yellow color is absorbed. From 100 to 200 meters, green color is absorbed. And beyond 200 meters, the blue color is absorbed. And violet and indigo is much above that. And if you go underwater more than 1,000 meters, it's completely dark. This was discovered only after science has advanced. This is the first reason of the darkness in the depths of the ocean. The second reason is that when sunlight is before reaching the earth, many a times it's obstructed by the clouds. And you find that there's a dark patch below the cloud. The light is absorbed by the clouds. Those light rays which are not absorbed by the cloud, it reaches the ocean. And many a times by the superficial waves on the top, it is reflected. The light is reflected and you see a shiny color on the ocean. The light is reflected. That light which is not reflected, it enters the ocean and is absorbed in layers. So these are the major reasons. But the Quranic verse says that the state of the mind of an unbeliever is like the depths of ocean waves topped with waves topped with dark clouds we knew very well that the waves that we see above on the ocean on the sea we see it but science recently discovered that besides the waves on top there are even internal waves this internal waves it separates the ocean into two parts the superficial part and the deep part the superficial part is warm and lit up and the deep part is dark and it is cold. So the Quran says wave topped with waves topped with dark clouds. And if a man stretches his hand, he cannot see it. For to whom Allah gives no light, no light reaches. Prophet Durga Rao said that this information which is mentioned in the Quran cannot be written by human being. This book, the glorious Quran, has to be a divine revelation.
in the field of geology, the scientists they tell us that the radius of the earth is approximately 3,750 miles. And the deeper layer, it is hot and fluid and cannot sustain life. And the superficial layer on the earth crust on which we live is about 1 to 30 miles in thickness. It is due to the folding phenomena which gives rise to mountain ranges which give stability to the earth. It is due to the folding phenomena which gives rise to mountain ranges due to which the earth is stable. The Quran says in Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 6 and 7, it says that we have made the earth as an expanse. Well, Jibala Autada and the mountains as sticks. The Arabic word used for mountains is Autad, meaning sticks, meaning tent pegs. How when you put a tent peg into the ground, the major portion goes underground and the head remains on top. Similarly, the Quran describes the mountains as sticks, as tent pegs. The mountain that we see above the superficial part of the earth is a very small portion. What we see inside underground, the roots of the mountain are much more deeper than what we see on top. Like when we see an iceberg in the ocean, the top part that we see above the water is a small percentage. The major portion is below in the water. Similarly, the mountains, what we see on top is a small portion. The mountain has got deep roots. And this gives stability to the earth. As the Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 31, that we have placed on the mountains, we have placed on the earth, mountains standing firm, lest it would shake with you. So Quran describes the function of the mountain as to prevent the earth from shaking. One of the most famous books in the subject of geology is the earth. And this book is referred by most of the universities in the subject of geology. And one of its author, his name is Frank Press, Dr. Frank Press, who was the president of the Academy of Sciences of USA previously. He was also the science advisor to the ex-president of USA, Jimmy Carter. He draws in this book, The Earth, the mountains, and he shows that the mountains have got deep roots, like wedges. And he writes in this book that the function of the mountain is to prevent the earth from shaking. Exactly what the Quran says 400 years ago. In the field of biology, the Quran says in Surah Ambiya, Chapter number 21, verse number 30. We have created everything from water. We have created every living thing from water. We really not then believe? Imagine in the deserts of Arabia, 1400 years back, the Quran says every living thing is made of water. Who would have believed in it? Today, after science advanced, we have come to know that every living creature is made up of cells. And the basic unit of cell is cytoplasm, which contains 80 percent water. Today, science tells us that every living creature has 50 to 90 percent water. What we came to recently, Quran mentioned 40 years ago, that he has created every living thing from water. The Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse 45, that we have created every animal from water. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse 54, we have created every human being from water. In the field of botany, Previously, we thought that, like the human beings, the plants did not have sexes. It is recently we have come to, 100 years back, 200 years back, 300 years back, that even the plants have got sexes, male and female. Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse 53, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sends on water from the sky. And from it, He brings forth various plants in pairs. Each is separate from the other. The Quran says that the, pair, the, the plants are created in pairs, as watch, male and female. Today, science after advance, we have come to know that even the plants have got sexes, male and female, which we learn in school. Quran says in Surah Raj, chapter number 13, verse number 3, we have created every kind of fruit in pairs, twos and twos. 
the Quran says in Surah Dariyat, chapter number 51, verse number 49, that we have created every living thing. We have created everything in pairs. We have created everything in pairs. For example, even electricity. Today science tells us it has got pairs, negative and positively charged ions. The protons and the electrons. Quran says in Surah Yasin, chapter 36, verse number 36, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything what the earth produces in pairs. Also it's humankind in pairs. And things which the human beings don't know, even that in pairs. So the Quran says, not only Allah has created everything what the earth produces in pairs, and the human beings in pairs, He has even created everything what the human being doesn't know in pairs. So science hasn't advanced that far, to, to, to acknowledge everything has been created in pairs, but the Quran says, even what the human beings don't know, Allah has created in pairs. In the subject of zoology, the Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 38, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has created every animal that lives on the earth and every bird that flies in the air. To live in communities like the human beings. Today science tells us that the animals and birds, they live in communities like the human beings. Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 68 and 69, that the Lord has taught the bee to build its cells in hills, in trees, and in human habitations, and to find the spacious path of thy Lord with great skill. What does the Quran mean by saying that Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught the bee to find the spacious path of thy Lord with great skill? Today after science advance we have come to know that whenever a bee finds a new flower or a new garden, it goes and tells its fellow bee the exact direction of the new flower or the new garden by a process known as bee dance. And so fond fresh. In 1973, he got a Nobel Prize for describing the behavior of the bee, which the Quran mentioned 1400 years ago. Further, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 68 and 69, the gender used for the female bee is Fasluki or Kuli, meaning a female gender. The Quran says the worker bees are female bees. Previously, we thought it was the male bees which were the worker bee. No wonder Shakespeare. In his play, Henry the Fourth, he says that the soldiers, the male bees, the soldiers, they go out and they report to the king. But today science tells us it is not the male bee which are the worker bee, it is the female bees which are the worker bee, and they don't report to the king, they report to the queen. Imagine. Quran even mentions the gender of the bee as being a female. Quran says in Surah Ankabut, chapter number 29, verse number 41. That, that as to those who take for protectors, protectors anyone besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they build for themselves houses like that of the spider. For verily, the house of the spider is fragile and flimsy. Besides Quran saying that anyone who takes for protection, anyone besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they build for themselves houses like that of the spider, besides being the physical nature of the web as we know, it is very flimsy, it is fragile, Today science tells us that even the family relationships in the spider is not correct. Many a times the female spider kills the male spider and she is called as the black widow. So Quran not only describes the physical nature of the house built by the spider as being flimsy, it even talks about the family relationship as being weak. Quran says in Surah Namal, chapter number 27, verse number 17 and 18, that when Solomon, before Solomon marshaled his army of birds, men, jinns, and when they approached a lowly valley of ants, one of the ants said, O ye ants, get into the human habitations. Let Solomon and his army will trample you beneath the feet. People may think, what kind of a fairy tale book is the Quran? The ants, they're talking among themselves. It sounds like a fairy tale book. Today, after science advance, we have come to know that the animal or insect 
which has the closest resemblance to the lifestyle of the human being, it is the ant. The ant buries the dead the same way as the human beings do. They have a sophisticated method of labor in which they have a manager, they have a foreman, they have a supervisor, they have workers. They very often meet and they chat. They have a sophisticated method of communication. The ants even have marketplaces where they exchange goods. You know how we have souk, the marketplace? So even the ants have got marketplaces the same way as human beings where they exchange goods. And if the grain they are storing, if it gets wet, the ant gets it into the sunlight to dry as though it knew that humidity will cause rotting of the grain. And if the grain begins to bud, the chop of the bud as though they knew that budding will cause rotting of the grain. In the field of medicine, the Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 69, that from the belly of the bee, you get a drink of varying colors in which there is healing for humankind. Previously, we did not know that the honey we get is derived from the belly of the bee. We came to know 300 years back that the honey is from the belly of the bee. And today science tells us that there are mild antiseptic properties in the honey. No wonder the Russian soldiers in World War II, they used honey to cover up their wound, which due to the density, the fungus and bacteria was prevented to grow in the wound. It prevented the absorption of water and the healing was done with leaving away the scar tissue. And if honey obtained from a plant is given to a person who, who has allergy to that plant, that person starts developing resistance to the allergy. So Quran mentions in the honey, there is healing for humankind which we have came to recently. In the field of physiology, it was 600 years after the Quran was revealed that Ibn Afis, he described the blood circulation. And 400 years later, that is 1000 years after the Quran was revealed, William Harvey made it famous to the world. In school, we, are, we learn about William Harvey, he described the blood circulation, we hardly hear about Ibn Afis. It was Ibn Afis, 400 years before William Harvey, who discovered and described the blood circulation. William Harvey made it famous to the Western world. In short, the food that we eat, it enters the stomach. From the stomach, it goes into the intestine. From the intestine, the food constituents enters into the bloodstream. And via the bloodstream, it goes to the various different organs of the body, including the mammary gland, which is responsible for the production of milk. The Quran mentions the blood circulation and the production of milk in a nutshell. The Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 66, Verily in the cattle is a lesson for you. We give you to drink for what is within the body, coming from a conjunction between the constituents of intestine and blood, milk which is pure for you to have. The same message repeated in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 21. Verily in the cattle is a lesson for you. We give you to drink from what is within the body, milk which is pure for you to have. And, and in the cattle there are various benefits, and all the meat you can eat. So Quran describes in a nutshell the blood circulation and the production of milk which you came to know recently. In the subject of embryology, there were a group of scientists who collected all the data that was given in the Quran and the Hadith dealing with embryology, and they followed the verse of the Quran of Surah Nahal chapter 16 verse 43 and Surah Ambiya chapter number 21 verse 107 which says, Fasalu al zikri in kundulat alamun. If you don't know, ask the person who is an expert. So they collected all the matter given in the Quran and the Hadith dealing with embryology and they presented it to Prophet Keith Moore, who was one of the highest authority at that time. This took place about 30 years back in 1980s. And the President of the Keith Moore, who at that time was the highest authority in the subject of embryology. Embryology is the study of the development of the human being in the womb of the mother. Prof. Keith Moore was the head of the Department of Anatomy in the University of Toronto in Canada. When he read all the translation 
of the Quranic verses and the Hadith dealing with the theology, he said that most of the things mentioned in the Quran are 100% matching with modern discovery in embryology. But there are some things which I cannot say is right. Neither can I say it is wrong because I myself don't know about it. And two such verses of the Quran were the first two verses of the Quran to be revealed of Surah Ikra, chapter number 96, or Surah Alaq, chapter 96, verse number 1 and 2, which says, Ikra, Bismi Rabbika Allah Zikhalaq, Khalaq al Insana min Alaq. Read, recite, or proclaim in the name of the Lord who has created, who created the human being from something which clings the leech like substance. So, Professor Keith Moore said, I do not know whether a human being in the initial stages looks like a leech or not. So he went in the laboratory and under a very powerful microscope, he observed the early stages of the embryo and he was astonished at the striking resemblance. He took a photograph of a leech and observed the early stage of an embryo and was astonished at the striking resemblance. And he said, there were about 80 questions asked to him. He said that if you would have asked me these questions 30 years before, that is about 65 years back, I would not be able to answer more than 50% because embryology is a branch of medicine which has developed recently. And he said that the new thing that he learned from, from the verses of the Quran and from the Hadith incorporated in his book, The Developing Human. In his third edition, he wrote a book called Developing Human. In the third edition, in 1982, after incorporating the new information he got from the Quran and Hadith, he got the award for the best medical book written by a single author in the world that time. And this book was translated into very different languages of the world. The Quran says in Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 5 to 6 and 7, the Quran says, Does not man think from what is created? He is created from a drop emitted from a space between the backbone and the ribs. What does the Quran mean by saying human beings have been created from a drop which is emitted between a space between the backbone and the ribs? Today after science advance, I have come to know that the genital organs in the adults, in the male and the female, they originate from a space between the backbone and the 11th and 12th rib. Exactly the same space with the kidneys present. And in the male, the genital organs, they descend before the human being is born. In the, in the male, it descends down, and through the inguinal canal, it goes into the testicles. Inguinal canal, through the scrotum, it goes into the scrotum. The testicles descend down. And in the female, the ovaries descend to the true pelvis. But even after these organs have been descended, yet they receive the blood supply from the same space through the abdominal aorta that is the backbone and the ribs. Even the nerve supply comes from the same space. Even the lymphatic drainage and the venous return goes to the same space where the kidney is present between the backbone and 11th and 12th rib. So that's what the Quran says. The human beings have been created from a drop emitted from a space between the backbone and the ribs. The Quran says in Surah Mu'minun chapter number 23, verse number 12, and Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 5, that we have created the human being from a nutfa. A nutfa in Arabic means a minute quantity of liquid, a very small trickle. Today science tells us that the amongst in a normal emission, there are 3 million sperms that are emitted in one emission. Only one is sufficient to fertilize the ova. One. This, the Quran refers to as nutfa, a minute quantity of liquid. The Quran also says in Surah Sajda, chapter number 32, verse number 8, we have created the human being from a solala. Solala means the best part of the whole. The Quran says, out of the approximately, on average, 3 million sperms that are emitted in one emission, only one is required to fertilize the ova. This one out of 3 million, the Quran refers to as solala, the best part of the whole. So one one spermatozoa is sufficient to fertilize the ovum. The Quran further says in Surah Insan, chapter number 72, verse, uh, chapter number 75, 
verse number chapter 76 verse number 2 that we have created the human being from nutfatin amshaj a mingled minute quantity of mingled fluid nutfatin amshaj a minute quantity of mingled fluid and today science tells us that both the the ovum and the sperm the female and the male fluid is required for the production of the human beings which forms into the zygote and today science tells us that there are other fluid or seminal fluid and prostatic gland which also responsible which can be also included in this mingled quantity of liquid in the field of genetics today we have come to know that the sex in the child is determined by the 23rd pair of chromosome the 23 pair of chromosomes in a human being if the 23rd pair of chromosome if it is xx it's a female if it is xy then it's a male and today science tells us it is the male which is responsible for deciphering the sex of the child if in the male the sperm has x and y if the x take part in fertilization then a female is born if the y takes part then a male is born and quran says this in surah najm chapter number 4 chapter 53 verse 46 that we have created the human beings into male and female from a minute quantity of liquid gushing forth from a male the arabic word is tumna gushing forth from a male so the quran says it is the male fluid which is responsible for sex of the child further is mentioned in the quran in surah insan surah qiyama chapter number 75 verse number 36 37 38 39 that we have made the human being from a minute quantity of liquid from alaka then made into a mudka then gave it sex male and female from a minute quantity of sperm the arabic word is min man yumna minute quantity of sperm so quran says it is a sperm which is responsible for deciphering the sex of the child In the country where I come from, India, people normally prefer having daughters rather than sons for reasons best known to them. And if suppose a lady gives birth to a daughter, very often the mother-in-law will blame the daughter-in-law. Why did you give birth to a daughter? Whether it's male or a female, it's the hands of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. But according to the Quran and according to science, it says it is the male fluid. It is the male which is responsible for the fluid sex of the child. So if the mother now has to blame anyone, she should blame the son, not the daughter-in-law. The Quran says in Surah Az-Zumar, chapter number 39, verse number 6, that we have created the human beings in stages, in the womb of the mother, in three ways of darkness. When Prophet Keith Moore was given this verse of the Quran, what does the Quran mean that we have created the human beings in stages in the womb of the mother in three ways of darkness? So Prophet Keith Moore said that these three ways of darkness refers to the anterior abdominal wall, it refers to the uterine wall, and the amniocorionic membrane. So these three ways of darkness is mentioned in the Quran. Furthermore, the Quran describes the various embryological stages in great detail in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 12 to 14. The Quran says, we have created the human being from a minute quantity of clay. And we placed him in a minute quantity of liquid, nutfa. We placed this nutfa into a kararim makin, a place of security. Then we made the nutfa into alaka, a leech-like substance. Then we made the nutfa into mudga, a chewed-like lump. Then, then we, we made the mudga into izama that is bone. Then, then we clothed the bones with flesh, lahem. All? It, it refers to the uterine wall and the amniocorionic membrane. So these three ways of darkness is mentioned in the Quran. Furthermore, the Quran describes the various embryological stages in great detail. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 12 to 14. The Quran says, we have created the human being from a minute quantity of clay. And we placed him in a minute quantity of liquid. Nutfa. We placed this nutfa into a kararim makin, a place of security. Then we made the nutfa into alaka, a leech-like substance. Then we made the nutfa into mudga, a chewed-like lump. Then we made the mudga into izama, that is bone. Then we clothed the bones with flesh, lahem. 
Glory be to Allah who is the best to create. The Quran, in these three verses of Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse 12 to 14, describes the various embryological stages in great detail. It says that we have made place the nutfa, a minor quantity of liquid, into a karare makin, a place of security. And today science tells us that the child is protected posteriorly from the spinal cord, uh, from the spine. It also has the posterior muscles and also has the anti-abdominal wall. It says we made the nutfa into alaka. Alaka has got two meanings. One of its meaning is leech like substance. The other meaning is something which clings. And today science tells us that the embryo clings to the uterine wall. So the meaning of alaka meaning something which clings is scientifically correct. The other meaning is leech like substance as I told you earlier that one of the meanings of alaka is leech like substance and if you observe the shape of the early stage of embryo it looks like a leech furthermore besides looking like a leech it also behaves like a leech that's a blood sucker because the embryo derives its blood supply from the mother through the placenta so the leech like substance the blood sucker besides looking like a leech it also behaves like a leech previously in the 17th century, Ham and Lewenkock, they had said that the human being initially is present in the sperm and then gets sperms get lodged into the, in, into the uterus and it grows to be a human being and a baby is born. Later on, later on in the 18th century, the graph have propounded and when they came to know that the size of the ovum is bigger than the sperm then the theory changed the miniature human being is then the ovum and then becomes into a human being later on more paratus he propounded the bipedal theory that both the sperm and the ovum both are equally responsible to form the zygote and to give birth to the human being here the quran says we made the alaka into a mudka. Mudka means a chewed like lump. So Prof. Keith Moore, we took a plaster seal and made it look like, a, like an early stage of an embryo. And then he bit it between his teeth to make it look like a mudka, a chewed like lump. And when he saw it, the teeth marks, they resemble the somite from where the nerves develop. Then the Quran says, we made the mudka, the chewed like lump, into bones. Then we clothed the bones with lamb, flesh. Glory be to Allah who is the best to create. Here we come to know when Allah says at this stage, at, until this stage, the development in all the other living creatures, the animals like rabbit, fish, is same like the human beings. It's only after this stage that distinct characteristics like a head, limbs, arms, etc. are formed where you can differentiate a human being from the other embryo. And in the Keith Moore was shown the stages, he said that the stages described in the Quran Alaka, Mudka, Izaman, based on the shape, is far superior to the embryological stages described in modern embryology. They describe as stage one, stage two, stage three. It's difficult to decipher. The way the Quran describes based on shape is far more superior and easy for identification as compared to modern embryology. The Quran says in Surah Insan, Chapter number 76, verse number 2. That we have given the human beings the gift of hearing and sight. The Quran says, first comes hearing, then comes sight. Today, after science advance, we have come to know that the embryo, when it's there in the womb of the mother, the first sense to develop is the sense of hearing. By the 24th week, the embryo, when it develops, it can hear. The human baby can hear at the time of 24 weeks and at, at the age of 28 weeks then the baby can start seeing so the Quran rightly says first is hearing then is sight and that's the reason that we heard in the hadith that our beloved Prophet said that the woman who's pregnant she should do good things she should hear good things she should speak good things and there was a research that was done that there were 10 newborn babies that were taken and one newborn baby was that of a typist i'm talking about olden days when that manual typewriter manual typewriter you had 
So they took a baby of a typist many years back, and other nine babies were just of normal mothers. After the babies were born, when the typewriter was sounded, the baby of the typist, he did not get scared. He was used to it. But all the other nine babies got scared. You know, because the baby was used to hearing the typewriter sound of the mother typing. So, so this was a test, test that was done many years back. back. So the Quran, Quran rightly says, first, first is, the is the sense of hearing, hearing then that is the sense of sight. The Quran, the Quran says in, in Surah Qiyamah, chapter, chapter number 75, verse number 3 to 4, that, that when the unbelievers say, that, that how will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be able to resemble our bones on the day of judgment? After, after we have died, died after, after we have been buried, buried after, after our, our bones, bones have got disintegrated, how, how will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be able to reconstruct our bones on the day of judgment? So Allah says, tell them, Allah can not only reconstruct the bones, He can reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of the fingers. What does Quran mean by saying Allah can reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of the finger? It was in 1880 that Sir Francis Gold, he described the fingerprinting method. And, and he said, said that, that no two individuals, even in a million people, the fingerprints are identical. And, and today, this, this fingerprinting method is used by the police, by the CIA, by the, by the FBI, you know, know the criminals to identify the person. And, and today, today not, not only criminals, everyone has to use fingerprints, you know. After 9-11, when you enter the airport, fingerprinting. Previously, fingerprints were only for the criminals. Now it is commonly used you know, for most of the individuals, you know, after 9-11. So imagine... So Francis Gold discovered in 1880, Quran mentioned 14 years back that Allah can not only reconstruct the bones, they're talking about the bones, Allah can reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of the finger. I would like to end my talk by giving the last example of Professor Taqar Dakashan. Professor Taqar Dakashan hailed from Thailand and spent a great deal of time in doing research on pain receptors. Previously, the doctors, we thought, that, that only, only the brain was responsible for feeling of the pain. After science advance, we have come to know there is something like pain receptors present in the skin which is responsible for feeling of the pain also. That is the reason when a patient of burn injury comes to a doctor, the doctor takes a pin and pricks it in the area of burn. If the patient feels pain, the doctor is happy. The pain receptors are intact. If the patient does not feel pain, the doctor is sad. The pain receptors have been destroyed. It's a deep burn. The Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 56, that as to those who reject our signs, we shall cast them into the hellfire. And as often as the skins are roasted, we shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain. As often as the skins are roasted, we shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain, indicating there is something in the skin, which today we call as pain receptors, which are responsible for the feeling of the pain. When, when Prophet Tarawat was, shown, was shown, shown the translation of this verse, Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 56, he could not believe in it. That I spent so much of time doing research and this book, 1400 years old, how can it mention about pain receptors? After verifying the translation and speaking with scientists like Prophet Keith Moore, he was so impressed that in the 8th medical conference in Riyadh, in the conference itself, Prophet Tarot Akashan said, and he gave the Shahada, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There's no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad the Messenger of Allah. Wa akhir dawan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakallah khair to Dr. Zakir Naik for that very informative and beneficial talk. Before we take question and answers from the floor, we want to announce that there are two people who would like to enter Islam tonight. So we'd like to request the team to bring the two people here to the stage. They can do that now for them to say the Shahada, inshallah.
Do we have the two people to come to the stage? Alhamdulillah, two brothers from Nigeria, they want to give the shahada. I would like to ask them that, do you believe that there's one God? Yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. Do you believe that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. And I'll just say it in Arabic and you can repeat it inshallah. Ashadu. 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 Allah, Allah, Ilaha, Ilallah, Illallah, Illallah, Wa Ashadu, Ashadu, Anna, Anna, Muhammadan, Muhammad, Abduhu, Abu, Warfulu, Warfuzu. I, I bear witness. I bear witness. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. There is no God but Allah. And Prophet Muhammad. And Prophet Muhammad is, is the servant, servant is and, and messenger of Allah. And messenger of Allah. Mashallah, Allah Muslim, Mashallah. Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that inshallah he uh, yeah, 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 grants you Jannah. Takbir. 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 Can you have the stand? Mashallah, it is a coincidence that before coming to Dubai, last month I was in Nigeria. And, and the last shahada that I gave was in Nigeria, mashallah. So even after coming from Nigeria to Dubai, I think the trend is continuing. I was then Abuja and I was then Lagos. It's the first time I had gone to the heart of Africa. I've been to South Africa before. And in Nigeria, it was a beautiful martial experience. And we saw there, mashallah, that many of the Christians gave shahada. And many of the murtads who had become from Muslim to Christian came back to the religion, alhamdulillah, by Allah's guidance. So we will take questions from the floor. We have a microphone to go around. If uh, you could put your hands up for the questions and the microphone will be handed around. Okay, Dr. Zaka suggested that whoever wants to ask a question can form a queue. I believe we have one possibly already over there. Normal procedure that we have, people may be aware that those, those who like to ask a question can make two here. One view on the left and one on the right. I request that if volunteers, if there's a stand, or if volunteers can catch the microphone. Again, we one queue on my left, one queue on my right. So we'll have two queues. All those who like to ask a question can please queue on my left, on my right. Can I have a look at the volunteers, please? I want two volunteers who can hold the microphone on my left. If we can have two of the, if we can have, as Dr. Zarkas requested, two of the volunteer team 
yes. One, one there. there. A second volunteer here having a microphone. Yeah, yeah we have that. In the front, in the front, in the front. Can you come in the front, brother, please? Come, come ahead of the barricade. If, if they can make a queue that's coming close to the stage on both sides, please. Yes, come ahead. You can make the queue here. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. That's, That's the second, second microphone. microphone. The first microphone is on the left. Volunteer can be there. Uh, before, before we start the question and session, normally we have a policy that when we attend, when we go for a lecture, I have a requirement which are very few. I don't require a five-star hotel. I require a microphone on the stand. You know, because when a mujahid goes to the battlefield, he requires a weapon. This is my weapon, my microphone. A good system. And besides that, we also set the rules and regulations that when we have the question and session, when you, anyone asking the question, please ask one question at a time. Please mention your name and profession so it will be easier for me to answer. Mention your name, mention your profession, ask only one question at a time. If you have a second question, please go behind the queue and after other people have finished, then you can answer. And please keep the question brief and to the point, short and sweet. For the Muslims, the question should be only on the topic Quran and modern science compatible and compatible. As for the non-Muslim, they can ask any question on Islam and compared to religion. Before we, take, before we take the question from the Muslims, as a general policy, as you may be aware, we first want to give a chance to the non-Muslim brothers and sisters. If there are any non-Muslim brothers and sisters, they sh I don't know whether the sisters are there in the other hall or not. Sisters are there in the other hall? Yeah, the sisters in an adjacent hall. Ah, so the third microphone is in the sisters section. Yeah, it's with me. So, so we first request that if there are any non-Muslim brothers and sisters, they should be given the first chance. So I request the volunteer who is handling the microphone to first give chance to the non-Muslims. If there are any non-Muslims in the queue, they should come in the front and ask the first question. The non-Muslims today are our guest of honors. Give them the first chance. After the non-Muslims have exhausted the questions, then we can take the question from the Muslim side. So I request the volunteers and I request the non-Muslims. This is the opportunity. Normally, in a religious, after a religious talk, you don't have question and answer session. This is the opportunity. You can ask any question on Islam and compared to religion, question on Islam, on Christianity, on Hinduism, on the Bible, on the Vedas. This is the opportunity. Anything which you feel is wrong in Islam, you can ask. This is the opportunity. We have one queue on my right here, one on my left, and one is sister's side. Are they non-Muslims here? No. Any non-Muslims? No. Any non-Muslims to ask a question? Any non-Muslim on the left-hand side? No. I cannot see the queue on the left-hand side. Can you come in the front, please? The queue can start from the front. I can, if I can see the queue, please. If, if, if the microphone can be bought a little bit in the front. Jazakallah. It is difficult. Dubai not having non-Muslim. Difficult. Uh, are there non-Muslims? I remember when I came in the last time in Ramzan. I think it was 2009. There were 30,000 people. And the non-Muslim did not give a chance to the Muslims to ask the question. Even that was Ramzan. Are there non-Muslims? Non-Muslims non -Muslim in the audience? Yes, yes we got one here. Okay. Okay. Yes, brother, most welcome. Your name, your profession, and your question, brother. All of the non-Muslims, this is the opportunity. Please don't feel shy. You know, you are absolutely safe here. You can ask any question. You can criticize the Quran. You can criticize Islam. I can take it. I'm young. I can take it. Yes, brother. Your name and your profession. Good evening, Mr. Zakir Naik. My name is Karan. And I'm a chartered accountant by profession. Uh, actually, a uh, few days back, I started uh, viewing your lectures on YouTube. Uh, firstly, I was very, very, you can say, irritated by the talks you give. But as and when I explore uh, your more talks, so I was like 80 to 90 percent convinced what you say is right. And now I have a specific uh, question on uh, where Islam allows more than one marriage for uh, a male. Uh, the reason which I found uh, given by you is 
the number of uh, females in the world is more than the males so this is one of the reason you gave and i don't know whether it comes out of your logic or the logic of s uh, some other scholars or the logic given by the quran so i just want to clarify from the, where this logic has come brother mashallah he has been seeing my lectures since a few months initially was irritated then he realized that 80 90% is right i'm here to convince the balance 10 20% inshallah brother thanks thanks a lot he asked the question that when i said in my answer that why does islam allow a man to have more than one wife one of the reasons i rightly said is that the female population is more than the male population he is asking me is it my logic or is it the logic of the quran the quran doesn't mention the reason the quran is a telegraphic message sometimes it mentions the reason sometimes it doesn't mention for example alcohol it says in it is more loss less profit the details are not given in the quran about marrying more than one wife it's not mentioned because the female population more it is my research and from my research i have analyzed that but when you go on the net today what you get the statistic today is not correct for example many statistics that you get in these ratio on the net is not correct for example it says that the population of qatar the men are three times more than female I was shocked. How is it possible? Then I came to know it is not the Qatari. Many people, because the Qataris are so less, hardly about 150,000. There are many people from outside coming to work, and when most of the workers are male, so it is not the Qatar population. It is the Qatar mixed with expatriates. So everything what you find in the net may sometimes shock you. It is not correct. So when you do better research, you come to know. So as far as today's thing is concerned. there are more females in the world than the male that's the reason one of the reasons why polygamy is allowed and there are other reasons given in my answer is there any question on that no thanks not on that so you only want to know is it my reasoning or is it the quran's reasoning yeah yes sir no quran says that as you heard my talk that one of the reasons is because the population of the female is more right and the male population is less you're right and if every man marries one woman then there will be very women who will not get husbands right so the only option for them is they either they marry a man who already has a wife or become public property right so you may say public property it is a very harsh word it is the best word i can think of like in usa alone there are more than 4 million females more than male in russia alone there are 10.3 million for 10.3 million females more than male if every man in russia or in america marries a woman yet there will be 10.3 million in russia and more than 4 million in usa who won't find husbands so the only option remaining for them is that they either marry a man who already has a wife or become public property and but naturally any modest woman would prefer marrying a man who already has a wife than become public property hope that answers the question okay thanks so now you're convinced i would like to know from you brother which is the 10 20 person you want more clarification on actually i am convinced to an extent but but uh, if you take an interpretation out of the sacred books then if i am a non muslim and if i read a, a quran so i will not uh, i will not get the same meaning if an islamist read that no not necessary so if we if we leave it to interpretation then there may be the interpretation for other scriptures also no interpretation is there but it should not contradict the meaning you cannot interpret with the wrong meaning Find a person who has more knowledge. It's not necessary that a Muslim can interpret whether non-Muslim. Keith Moore was a non-Muslim. Keith Moore, he is a non-Muslim. He interpreted the Quran better than the Muslims. What the Quran says in Surah Nahl, chapter 16, verse 43, and Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 7: First, alu al zikri in kuntul atalamun. As the person who is an expert. So in embryology, he was an expert, a non-Muslim. His interpretation of embryology is far better than the Muslim because an expert. So to interpret the Quran, you have to go to the expert in that field. If the Quran speaks about fiqh, about luka, then go to an Arabic expert. If the Quran speaks about science, go to a scientist. So in this example I gave in my talk, the non-Muslim scientists they interpreted the Quran better. The same way you read the Quran, it's not necessary you don't understand. You may understand better than a Muslim. What I want to know. That, that which 10 20 person are not convinced about so i will convince you on that also so that that again i'll come to your next session and uh, inshallah i will be convinced 100% okay very next see we don't know when next session will be there
He won't happen actually. We say, Inshallah, you're saying, Inshallah, that's good. Inshallah, means God willing. You don't know how long you're going to live. So, my next schedule to come is in March 2014, Inshallah, when they have the peace convention, the, th the, the, the third peace convention when they have in 2000 and 2014, March or April. That will be my next public lecture, Inshallah. But you don't know whether I will live till that time or not. No, but, but we hope so. We hope so, but now if you have any question, then if you're convinced now, uh, do you believe there's one God? I believe in one God. I believe. Do you, do you believe Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God? Uh, I don't 100% agree because I have not read the <laughs> Quran. So what I want you to do, read, read the Quran. Not that you have to read the Quran to understand about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I've even proved in my lecture from the Hindu scriptures. Have you heard my lecture on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Hindu scriptures? Yes, I do. Yeah. If you, you have heard. Yeah. So from there, I proved about Kalki Avatar. Yeah. That in Kalki Avatar, it speaks about a messenger to come, an avatar to come, whose father's name is Vishnu Yas. Kalki Purana, chapter number 2, verse number 4, 5, 7, 9, 11, 15. It says, the father's name is Vishnu Yas. Vishnu means God, Yas means servant, servant of God. In Arabic, it's Abdullah, and Abdullah was the name of the father of Muhammad. The mother's name is Sumati. Sumati means peace and serenity. In Arabic, it means Amina. The name of the mother of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is Amina. It says that he will have four companions, the four Khulfa Rashidin, Hazrat uh, Abu Bakr, Hazrat Umar, Hazrat Usman, Hazrat Ali. The four companions. He got this revelation in night in a cave. And we know Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam got the first revelation in the night in the uh, Garahira. He will migrate northwards and come back. Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam migrated northward to Medina and came back. So all these prophecies, description about the final avatar to come according to the Hindu scripture, according to Kalki avatar, according to Vedas Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, And the name of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is mentioned more than 100 places in the Hindu scripture. If you read the Upanishad also, if you read the uh, Puranas also, Bhavishya Purana, Parvatri, Khandatri, Adetatri, Shloka number 3 to 8, it talks about Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Bhavishya Purana, Parvatri, Khandatri, Adetatri, Shloka number 8 to 27, it speaks about Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, so uh, have, have you, you seen this tape of mine? Sorry, again? Uh, have have you, you heard my lecture on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, prophecy of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hindu scripture? Have you heard that? I have heard that. I have uh, like. So, so do you have any objection in that? Do you, do you say that no, this is not there in the scripture, this is not there in the Veda? Okay, logical on, on the face value, accept it. But I have to read my scripture first, and then I can get. Okay, fine. So I, have, so I request you that you read it as soon as possible. Don't wait till I come in March. Okay. If you are convinced in between, you can take Shahada with any Muslim. If you are not, then when I come, Inshallah, we will meet again in March or April. Inshallah. Dr. Zakar. We have one lady, her name is Miss Berlin. Yes, sister. Yeah. She has a question? She has a question, yes. Yes, sister, most welcome. Good evening, Dr. Nayak. Good evening. My name is Perin Abbas. I am born in a Muslim family, but not a practicing Muslim, um, because I am not. I don't understand what I am supposed to do. So um, my uh, my profession is that of a uh, management trainer and a life coach. My question for you today is: um, I see a lot of Muslims around me. They follow the religion because of fear. Fear of Allah, fear of uh, going to hell. Um, and my question to you is that shouldn't this be based on uh, motivation to do the right thing as opposed to fear of um, burning in hell or roasting in hell as I've seen in some of your other lectures? Sister so, asked. Okay. Yes, anything else? No, no, this is it. Thank you. Sister asked a very good question. That she sees around, she says that she's born in a Muslim family, not a practicing Muslim. Inshallah, we pray that she becomes practicing from today, Inshallah. Dr. Zakar, there is another woman. She's also a Christian. Sorry? We have another lady, she's Christian. After, after, let me answer the question first. Sure. The sister said that she sees around the Muslims that many a time they follow the teachings of Islam because of fear. So shouldn't it be, fear is not right, it should be love. Why people... You know, you know follow, follow because of fear. Sister, Sister Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives guidance in the Quran. And while giving guidance, he gets people to the straight path in three ways. With fear, with love, and with logic. Depending upon the requirement, the best is love. 
Even logic is very good. Alhamdulillah. Even fear is good. Depending upon the situation. Sister, I would like to ask you a question. Suppose, are you married? No, I'm not. Okay. Maybe your younger brother. Fine. Younger brother who's five years old, hypothetically. He wants to jump from the 10th floor. You tell with love, no, no brother, don't jump. He yet wants to jump. What will you do? Will you slap him or not? Yes. When you slap him, he gets scared. He will not jump. I will tell you, oh sister, you are a terrorist. You are making your younger brother scared. See, first you tried with love, he's not listening to you. You slap him, he gets scared, he doesn't jump. Your reason was, you are cruel to be kind. You are cruel to be kind. You slap him because he is illogical. He doesn't understand the matter with love. Because if he jumps, he will die. So to prevent him from dying, you are slapping him, he gets scared, he benefits. You may or may not benefit, but he's benefiting. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, he speaks with love, he speaks with logic, he even puts sometimes fear. So then he also attracts people with Jannah. That if you do good deeds, you go to Jannah. Love each other, help your neighbors. When you're helping others, so all these things, one is reason and logic, one is fear, one is love. Fear is also a factor which does really help a lot because those who are not logical and those who don't believe in love, fear helps and once when they try following with fear, once he becomes the adult, then he doesn't require fear. Then logically he will not jump. Correct sister? Correct. The so, thing that children are brought up, uh, at least I've been brought up with mainly fear of uh, Allah. So it's generally uh, to do with uh, if you don't do it, this is going to happen. So there is less what, of... What I would say that the people who bought you up did not bring you up in the right way. But, but, but now, now they won't be a responsible, you will be a responsible because you're an adult sister. Now, now you're an adult, you cannot say because the people who bought me up, <laughs> because they bought me up with fear, no, I'm not a practicing Muslim. Allah will question you. Now you heard the lecture of Quran and science. Was there any fear in it? No. Yes, the last statement did say about the pain receptors, but that was scientific. Fear was involved in it, but it was scientific. What I'm asking you, after you hear this lecture, don't you think Quran should be followed? So, so now, now you have no excuse. excuse. You, you had excuse till yesterday. Till yesterday, yesterday you could say that the people who bought me, they bought me up with fear. Therefore, I'm not a practicing Muslim. Now, when you heard a logical lecture, and there's a question answer time, that what you feel is not right in Islam, you can question. After this, you will not have an excuse that why you're not following Islam. So everything has a reason and logic. Fear is one factor which may be used for those people who are illogical or less in sense. So that may be temporary, sister. Now surely that after we have heard this lecture which is based on reason and logic and science, you have no excuse for not following Islam. And anything what you don't know, the Quran says, ask the person who knows. So anything you think about Islam, that fine, Islam says that, it may say that you have to fast. If you don't fast, you go to hell. You can ask a scientific person, I can give a talk on scientific talk on what is the benefit of fasting. So those people who don't understand reason and logic, they may, they may get convinced for fear. Some people may say, when you fast, you go to Jannah. So there are different strategies used by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is our creator. He knows what is required and how do we behave. So based on that fear, many a time is helpful in getting a person on the straight path. But the moment the fear is removed, that person should stand on his own feet and be able to do the things correctly, not because of fear. Finally, it is because of love and because of reason and logic that he wants to go to Jannah and he wants to benefit sister. So I hope inshallah from today you'll be practicing Muslim inshallah sister. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, sister, most welcome. We have here on the men's side, on the left, two non-Muslims who want to ask a question. Please go ahead, please. Uh, sir, my greetings, uh, doctor, and greetings also to the congregation. I'm called Amin from uh, Cameroon, that's in Africa. Uh, doctor, we appreciate your sermon that you are delivering this evening uh, concerning uh, science and the uh, Quran. And, uh, doctor, can you speak a bit, can you speak a bit slowly, a bit slowly and more clearly? Can you speak a bit loudly and slowly? I have said I'm um, called Amin. I'm from Africa, Cameroon. And, uh, What's your name you said? Amin. Are you a Muslim? Uh, on, my, on my journey to a Muslim. Are you a Muslim or a non-Muslim? 
I am not Muslim and my journey is moving towards the Muslim which I want to ask them um, question for detailed clarification. But you are a non-Muslim? Uh, at the moment. Yes, yes brother. Uh, doctor, I would like to ask you to clarify this doubt that is the bond of contention between the Christian and the Muslim. Uh, my question goes, I would, would like you to give me in detail some of the extraordinary signs and wonder that Prophet Muhammad uh, showed when on his days on earth, which are far from uh, ordinary other human beings. Like uh, in the Christianity, we say that uh, Jesus uh, did some miracles, like uh, raising the dead from the uh, dead, walking on top of the sea. So, which we know that he was an extraordinary human being. We know fully away that, and I particular, that uh, Prophet Muhammad was the Messiah, uh, messenger from uh, Allah. So, I would like you, doctor, to tell me some of those extraordinary work or miracles that he performed that we, you and I, cannot do it today. That is my question. Brother, brother has asked a question. Can you increase the volume a little bit of my microphone? A little bit. Or increase the volume of the monitor speakers. Brother asked a question that how Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, performed miracles, raising the dead to life, giving uh, sight to the blind. What miracles did Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do? Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did many miracles. For example, he split the moon into two. Fine. He even spoke to the stones and the stone wished him salams. He did many miracles, but miracles of two types. There are certain miracles which have done in the past, you cannot go back and check. For example, Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, gave life to the dead. Quran says that we believe it. But today someone tells me, go and prove it, that Jesus gave life to the dead, peace be upon him. I cannot do it. I cannot do it. I believe in it because Quran says. You believe in it because the Bible says that. But can you prove it scientifically that Jesus gave life to the dead, peace be upon him? Can you prove it? No. Jesus gave sight to the blind. Quran says that. I believe it. You believe because the Bible says that. If a non-Muslim or a non-Christian asks me, can I prove it? No, I cannot go back and prove. So all these miracles are time bound. Are time bound. Same thing what the prophet did, he split the moon, you cannot go back in time and prove it. I cannot go back. Scientifically they say there is a fissure in the moon, maybe, maybe, we don't know. The biggest miracle of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the Quran. The miracle of miracles. It is the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which was revealed to the prophet. And the prophet memorized it and repeated it. This is a miracle. And this miracle can be even verified today. So today's talk was Quran and modern science, compatible or incompatible. From this, we are even proving the authenticity of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the prophet to whom the Quran was revealed and he repeated it. This proved it's a miracle. So this is the only miracle that I know of, which is not time bound, which could be proved that time because that time was the age of that time was the age of science and technology. That, that time, time people did not know about technology. technology. But, but that, that time was the age of literature and poetry. The way the Quran was, made. like for example, Quran says pork is haram. Today, I can give scientific reasons why pork is haram. There are so many diseases in it. There's more fat building material, every blah blah. At that time, the weight was said, The weight was said in a poetic fashion. The Arabs believed in it. So at that time was the age of literature and poetry. Today is not the age of literature and poetry. So Quran proved itself at that age. When it was the age of literature and poetry, Quran proved, proved itself with the word of God in today's age of science and technology. Tomorrow may be some another technology. Whatever technology comes tomorrow, Quran will even prove itself to be the word of God at that time. That is the reason. In the beginning of my talk I said, for a book to claim, it's the word of God. For a book to prove, it's a revelation from Allah. It should pass the test of time. So Quran has passed that test. If you put that test to the Bible, if you put science to Bible, Bible will fail. I can give a lecture only on unscientific things mentioned in the Bible. You know, I can give a long lecture only on unscientific things mentioned in the Bible. So if you put this test to the Bible, Bible fails the test. If you put this test to any other scripture in the world besides the Quran, all the scriptures will fail the test except the Quran.
So the living miracle of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the Quran. So do you now believe in Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Yeah, I believe. You believe in Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Yeah. Do you believe in Prophet Muhammad? Uh, no, Prophet Muhammad was a messenger of Allah. As a do you believe in that? Do you believe Jesus is God? Yeah, I believe. Do you, do you believe Jesus? Where is mentioned, mentioned in the Bible Jesus is God? There is no unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God or where he says worship me. If you can prove to me from the Bible any unequivocal statement, any unambiguous statement from anywhere in the Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God or where he says worship me, I am ready to accept Christianity today. I am not speaking on behalf of my other Muslim brothers and sisters. I am putting my head on the guillotine. If you can prove from the Bible any unequivocal statement, any unambiguous statement where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself said that I am God or where he says worship me, I am ready to accept Christianity. But doctor, if you can permit me to come in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I know that uh, when we say God in Arabic means Allah. And uh, I wish to see, uh, bring you back. When we say uh, in Arabic that uh, Allah means in English that God. Is it uh, the same God that we know is one in the universe that we are worshipping in two different languages? Brothers ask the question, the Allah that we say, is it the same as God? Allah. Allah is the Arabic word, God is the English word. I do not like translating Allah into God in English, but there is no other option. But God is not the correct translation of Allah. Why? Because the word God can be played around with. If you add S to God, it becomes God's in the plural of God. Allah is only one. You cannot have plural of Allah. If you add Father to God, it becomes Godfather. He is my Godfather. He is my guardian. There is nothing like Allah Father or Allah Mother in Islam. If you add Mother to God, it becomes God Mother. So God is a word which can be played around with. If you add D E S S to God, it becomes Goddess, meaning a female God. There's nothing like male Allah or female Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unique. Allah has got no gender. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got no father. If you add tin before God, it becomes tin God. There's nothing like tin Allah. That is the reason God is not the correct word. Allah is appropriate. But while speaking English, there's no better word I can use. So even I use the word God. There's no better word. But, but God word can be played around with, therefore the right word is Allah. That is the reason Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. If you read in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 15, verse 34, when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, put on the cross, he said, he cried out, Allah, 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 Sabaktani. Oh God, oh God, why has thou forsaken me? Original word said, Allah, 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 Sabaktani. He didn't say, oh God, oh God, why has thou forsaken me? Because he did not know English. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did not know English. And Hebrew and English, they are sister languages. Allah, Allah, Lama Sabakhtani is similar to Allah, Allah, Lama Taraktani. Oh God, oh God, why has thou forsaken me? So even Jesus Christ, peace be upon never used the word God, but he used the word Allah. And if you, if you refer to the Scofield Dictionary, in the Scofield Dictionary, it says Allah is same as Allah. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he never claimed divinity. He never, he never claimed he was God. So I want to ask you, when Jesus Christ did not claim God, why do you believe he's God? In fact, if you read in the Bible, in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 24, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, My father is greater than all. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, My father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devil with the spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. <coughs> Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I cast out devil with the finger of God. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says I seek not my will, but the will of Almighty God is a Muslim. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was a Muslim. So when Jesus Christ did not claim divinity, I am asking you, why do you believe he is God? Just because the church says. Not that the church says. Where does the Bible say? We understand that fully way that. That's what I'm going to tell you. The church is telling you. The church is misguiding you. We, the church, has a part to play, and we also. So you have to go and ask your father. You have to go and ask your priest that this person, Dr. Zakir Naik, I saw a man in Dubai, 
he was saying that nowhere does the, the Bible say Jesus is God. Nowhere does it say he himself says that he's God. And all these quotations, what they give, are all wrong interpretations. So that is the request to you, brother, to go and do your homework. See my lecture on similarity between Islam and Christianity. And inshallah, you'll come to know the truth. And you'll really believe that God is one. Believe Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God. And even Jesus is the messenger of God. Peace be upon him. Hope that answers the question. I thank you very much, doctor. We have a question, Dr. Zakir. Yes, sir. Non-Muslim? Non-Muslim? Yes, sir. Most welcome. Six ladies, actually. One, uh, one at a time, sister. One lady, then two gents, then one lady, inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, good evening, sir. Um, I've been listening and I was amazed by the testimony that you made. Um, I'd like to make a question, sir, because I was starting to study the Quran and um, I've noticed that the first uh, few chapters that I've read, um, you were... Uh, that the verses would start with the we when um, it would refer to uh, to sending the uh, the testimony of Quran to the people so I'm asking why the translation from Arabic uh, became uh, used the, the plural uh, we meaning there, there should be some entities to it uh, this is related to the Christian belief of the Trinity, and I would like to ask why. Sister, that's a question, and a very good question, that when the Quran says, Nahnu, why does Quran say, We, when speaking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And Allah speaks, why does he use we? It should be I. Why we? Sister, in most of the languages in the world, there are two types of plural. One is plural of number, the second is plural of respect. Like in English also, when we say we, it means more than one. But they are also called as royal plural. When the queen speaks, when the queen of England speaks, she says, we said this. She will not say, I said this. Because that is the royal plural. Same thing in Urdu or in Hindi. When uh, Rajiv Gandhi was the ex-prime minister of, of India, when he used to say, hum dekhna chaate hai. Not my dekhna chaata, hum dekhna chaate So there is a plural of number and plural of respect. So we can also be for for more than one person, we can also mean for a single person who is with respect. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes refers to himself as I, sometimes as we. When he refers as we, it is not more than one, it is singular, but it is, which is, it is a we, it is a plural of respect, sister. Hope that answers the question. Sister? Yes, sir. Um, Hope you are convinced with the answer. I, I heard you, sir, and uh, it will be taken into consideration. I'm studying right now. Um, sister, do you believe there's one God or many God? I have to read some more, sir. So do you believe there's one God, but? Um, Are you a Christian, sister? I am, sir. From I'm a Bible Christian, so most of my beliefs basically are based on the Bible. And um, um, I've studied the similarities of Islam with Christianity, but I'm now focused on the differences. And um, can I please have another, can I please ask another question, sir? Sure, sister. Um, uh, how do you, sir, because uh, uh, from the Bible concept, sir, there's an origin of sin. And um, that's, that's why we, we have the concept that we, are, we need, we needed to, we are needed, we need of a savior to save us from the sins that we've committed in the past and um, uh, how is this uh, how is this described and how does Islam solve the problem of sin sir? This was asked a very good question that she being a Christian she believes in the original sin so she says that the human beings are born in sins how, how does Quran solve this problem this concept of original sin sister is taught by the church it's not mentioned in the Bible Bible doesn't speak about that. It is the church which speaks about that. What does the Bible say? Bible says in the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 18, verse number 20, the soul that sins shall die. So the Christian missionaries, they quote this verse half. They put a full stop where there's no full stop. The soul that sins shall die. The complete verse says, the soul that sins shall die, the father shall not be the iniquity of the son, neither does the son bear the iniquity of the father. 
the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him the wickedness shall be upon him but if the wicked turns and comes back to the true path he will not die what does the what does the church teach that we human beings adam peace be upon him he ate the forbidden fruit and he was tempted by eve may allah be pleased with them both and because they ate the forbidden fruit that is the reason they are born in sin human being sister i am asking the question did adam ask you peace be upon him before eating the fruit no so why should you be held responsible it's um he didn't ask me also if you have asked me and i would have said yes then allah can hold me responsible so do you think allah is illogical do you think god is illogical when adam didn't ask you peace be upon him before eating the fruit how can he hold you responsible um i was taught sir that this was a consequence it was taught but do you think it's a logical teaching or illogical teaching uh, the logic is uh, being processed right now sir uh, that's why i'm studying both that's what i'm going to tell you it's illogical the what the quran says no bearer of burden can bear the burdens of others if you we believe in islam that every human being is born sinless irrespective of the born in a muslim family in a christian family in a hindu family in a jewish family if uh, uh, every human being is born masoom he is born sinless later on when he grows up he may start doing wrong things he may start doing idol worship he may start doing fire worship and then he becomes a non muslim every human being is born as a muslim muslim means person who submits himself to god because every human being a child is innocent and if a child dies he goes to jannah only after you grow and you start doing wrong things you start doing shirk and you start worshiping someone else besides god and you start lying you start cheating then the chances of going you go to well increase it so in the bible there is no concept of original sin this is a teaching of the church which is against the bible and even in islam we do not believe that human beings are born in sin we believe that every human being is born innocent later on when he grows older then he starts worshiping human being and if you start worshiping jesus peace be upon him he is a human being sister do you believe jesus is god i do at the moment sir ha so didn't i tell you earlier that nowhere did jesus christ peace be upon him claim divinity nowhere in the bible sir uh, on that note sir i would like to ask because if uh, jesus uh, was not divine um he would have oh, there there are people worshiping him uh, based on the bible sir when when uh, people were multitudes were around him um some of them say you son of god jesus son of god and if um if he were rightly a prophet sir he would have denied it not uh, tell yes, sister son of god is the terminology used in the bible for people who are godly people for prophets for example the bible says that adam was son of god bible says ephraim was son of god bible says uh, israel was son of god and the bible says in the book of romans chapter number 8 all that they led by the spirit of god are sons of god so son of god is the terminology used in the bible for godly people so you follow the teachings of god even you will be called the child of god if i follow the teachings of god i am called son of god son in the meaning of the bible is a person who follow the teachings of god and since prophet jesus peace be upon him was the messenger of god most verily was son of god in that language but he was not the begotten son How about John 3:16, sir? Ah, very good, sister. John 3:16. John 3:16 says what? John 3:16 says, "For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, whosoever believes in Him shall not die but have everlasting life." Now, this verse I'm quoting. You give me the reference. I'm giving you the quotation. You give me the reference. John 3:16. Yes. Now, this is quotation from King James version. But if you read the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. revised by 32 christian scholars of the highest eminence backed by 50 different corporate denominations what they say that the word begotten is interpolation is a fabrication is a concoction and they removed it from the bible this word begotten is not there in the original manuscript it's a fabrication it's a concoction it's a innovation so if you read the revised standard of the virgin it says for god so loved the world that he gave his son who say who believe it in him shall not have uh, shall not die now here as i told you son of god in biblical language means a prophet of god 
So I've got no problem in agreeing he's a prophet of God because begotten means what? Begotten means sired by God. Begetting is a, is a function of lower animals of sex. You cannot attribute such a thing to Almighty God. That is the reason Quran says, He begets not nor is he begotten. Surah Iqlas, chapter 112, verse number 3. So even in the Bible, this word begotten came as an interpolation. It has been removed. So now we say son of God, Bible has got sons by the tons. So anyone who is led by the spirit of God is son of God, sister. So in this way, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, not only according to the Quran, even according to the Bible, he is a messenger of God. So you have to believe that Jesus is messenger, but he is not God. Hope that answers the question, sister. Eight ladies, they have questions. So, is it possible for each woman to ask like quick questions? Uh, sister, we'll take. Uh, uh, we believe in justice. I believe that the gents are more than the ladies. I don't know how many ladies are there, but the gents are more than 5,000 here. 5,000 seats, and there may be six, 7,000 many sitting on the floor. So inshallah, if there are no gents among non muslims we'll come to the ladies. We'll just give two microphones for the gents, one for sister. Yes, your sir. name and your profession. Yes. My name is Rakesh Kumar and I am working as an assistant logistic manager in a food company. My question is, is it necessary to believe in Islam to reach Jannat or heaven? Because I have heard from my friends that who are Muslims, uh, the person who is non-Muslim will not go to heaven. So the other question, is it necessary for a human being to believe in Islam, to become a Muslim, to go to Jannah? He heard from a non-Muslim friend that non-Muslim will not go to Jannah. See, for everyone to pass an examination, there are rules and regulations. So to pass this test is the test for the hereafter. So if you have to pass in this test, you have to believe there is one God. You have to believe Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God. You have to do good deeds. The reason for going to Jannah is given in Surah Al-Asr, chapter 103, verse number 1 to 3, which says, Wal as that by the token of time, man is verily in loss, except those who have faith, those who have iman, those who believe, those who do righteous deed, those who exhort people to truth, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. There are four things required for any human guru janna. One is faith, iman, believing in God, believing in the messengers of God, believing in the books, believing in the angels, these are pillars of iman. Then you have to do righteous deed. Not, Not that, that if you say you are a Muslim, you believe in Allah and Messenger and you start robbing and you start cheating and you do all wrong things. So chances of going to Jannah is less. So besides having faith, you should have righteous deed. Exhort people to truth. Tell the truth to others and exhort people to patience and perseverance. These are the minimum four criteria required for any human to go to Jannah. And one of them is, but naturally you have to be a Muslim. So you mean to say that the person who is Muslim only go to uh, Jannah? And if a non-Muslim is there who is following all these practices, will not go to heaven. Ah, non-Muslim who follows all the practices, he becomes a Muslim then. Non-Muslim, for example, one of the major sins that Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 48 and Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 116, Allah if He pleases, He may forgive any sin, but the sin of shirk He will never forgive. Shirk means associating partners with God. If someone associates partners with God, worship somebody else. For example, the Christian worship Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. He was a messenger of God. But if you worship him as God, it is shirk. If you worship anyone besides the true almighty God as God, it's called as shirk. If you are doing shirk, you may be otherwise very good. You may be, uh, you may be very generous, you may be very kind, you may be giving charity, you may be helping the poor. For example, when I passed my 10th standard in ICSC, I had to pass in six subjects compulsory. Mathematics, history, geography, English, science, six subjects. I'm asking you, in five subjects I get 100 out of 100. In one subject I fail. So will I pass under 10? No. No. So here to go to Jannah, I require four things. Iman, righteous deed, I don't need people to truth, I don't people to So that non-Muslim may get 100 out of 100 in three things, but in Iman, he fails. You, you cannot say, no, 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 but he's very kind. So what is there? Can I, Can I ask you one more question? <laughs> so even if he passes in five subjects, 100 out of 100, yeah. if he gets 50-50 in six subjects, will he pass? Yeah. Yes. So 50-50 in six subjects will pass. But if you do shirk, in one subject you fail, 
we will fail the full examination. You may get 100 out of 100 and others. So that is the reason, unless you do not take out the shirk from your life, unless you do not worship the true God and believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you should not go to Jannah. Yes, brother. Who had made the religions? Allah have not made the religions. According to us, human beings have made the religions. So why we have to believe only Islam to follow and we have to go to heaven? Brother has asked a very good question. That we have made religions, so why should we follow Islam? Allah has only made one religion. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse number 19, in the deen in the law Islam, the only religion acceptable. The only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Islam. Islam means submitting a will to God. This, see this word may be allergy to many. Muslim may be allergic word. Islam may be allergy. So the right is the only religion acceptable in the sight of God is submitting a will to God. Now what has happened in the passage of time, people kept on changing the religion. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter 279, that's woe to those who write the book with their own hand and then say this from Allah. To traffic with it for a miserable pride. Woe to those for what they earn, woe to those for what they write. So here what we realize, I do agree with you, all the religions have been made by human beings except one. And that one religion is submitting a will to God. In Arabic we say Islam. So if you follow the teachings of God, you are following the right religion. You have to follow the teachings of God, not the teachings of human beings. Now what do you... What I told earlier to the sister and to the brother. Jesus is God is teaching of not of the Bible. It is the teaching of human being. You understand? Yeah. So teaching of human being you get from the original text of Almighty God. Now when you put this test of science to all the scriptures available on the face of the earth, the only scripture that will pass the test is the Quran. If you put this test to the Vedas, it will fail. If you put the test of the Bible, it will fail. So all these Bible, we believe that Injil was the way which was revealed to Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ peace be upon him. But the present Bible you have is a changed form of Injil. Original Injil was word of God, human being changed, as you rightly said. Human beings changed it. So today, though we believe that the first prophet is Adam alayhi salam, peace be upon him. Whatever was revealed by the earlier prophets, it was changed by the human being. But since Quran is the last and final revelation of Almighty God, it was not revealed only for the Muslims or the Arabs, it was revealed for the whole of humankind. And because it's the last revelation, no one will be able to change it. At that, so maybe you may say the Veda is word of God. I said maybe it was, maybe, I don't object, maybe. Maybe it was or maybe it was not, we don't know. But even if it was, all the scriptures that came before the Quran, whether it be the Bible, whether it be the Torah, whether it be all, because the Quran says in Surah Rad, chapter number 13, verse number 38, that we have revealed in every age a book. In every age have we revealed a book. So by name, four are mentioned in the Quran, Torah, Zabur, Injil and the Quran. But there were many other books like Sufi, Ibrahim and many other. So if you come and tell me today that Veda is the word of God, maybe it was, maybe it was. But it has been changed. There are many scientific errors in it. So today after it has been changed. And even if it was the word of God, all the, re all the revelations that came before the Quran and all the messengers that came before Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were meant for a particular group of people and was meant for a particular time period. So even if it was the word of God, it was meant only for those people and only for that time. Today, because Quran is the last and final revelation, it is not only meant for the Muslims or the Arabs, it's meant for the whole of humanity. And this is mentioned in the Quran several places. So today, you have to follow the last and final revelation of God, which is the Quran. All the other revelations that came before have been changed. And if you put this test of science, all the other scriptures will fail the test except the Quran. So if you understand logically, you'll come to the conclusion that Quran is the only true word of God which is unchanged. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. So, uh, do you want to go to heaven? Yes, I do. So do you believe there's one God? Yes, I do. Do you believe idol worship is wrong? Idol worship is wrong or right? No, according to me, you have to worship only one God. Correct. Yeah. Do you believe in one God? Yeah. But, but according to me, I believe on in, in that term, logic also, that, that if I am a Hindu, I'll continue with my practices. If I'm not converting into a Muslim, then too I'll go to heaven. 
No, no it is not the question of converting or not converting. If you believe in one God, yeah, and if you follow the teachings of God, you're a Muslim. In Arabic, you say Muslim. In in English, you say a person who submits will to God. Hindu, even I am a Hindu by definition. I come from India, you know. Yeah, I know. Hindu by definition means a person who lives in India. You know that. Hindu is the geographical definition for the people who come from the land of Indus Valley civilization. This word Hindu was used by the Arabs the first time. The Hindu word is never written in any Hindu scriptures before the advent of the Muslims to India, according to Jawaharlal Nehru in Discovery of India. Fine? This should be called as Vedantist, according to Swami Vivekananda. So Hindu means coming from India. So that way when I am a Hindu, but I am a Hindu Muslim. I am an Indian Muslim. But if you say Hindu means the person who does idol worship, then I'm not a Hindu. I don't do idol worship. I believe in one God. I also don't believe in idol worship. Very good, mashallah. So you do. You don't believe in idol worship. You believe in one God. Do you believe Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God? Yeah, I've heard from my friends, but I have not read the Quran. So, but do you believe Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God? Yeah, I believe. Hello. So then you're a Muslim. If you believe there is one God, if you don't believe in idol worship, and if you believe Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam messenger, you're a Muslim. You, you may not be fully practicing, you may be partly practicing, that is secondary. As long as you believe there is one God, and you believe idol worship is wrong, and you don't believe in false God, and you believe Prophet Muhammad is a messenger, you are a Muslim. You may not be very practicing, so then the chance of going to Jannah becomes very much possible. So that means you are a Muslim. I will say one thing, sir. You are trying to dominate, but I respect a lot of Islam, but I am not able to convert from your words. No, no, not to convert. But if you say you are just one God, you don't believe in idol worship, and you believe Prophet Muhammad's message, you are already a Muslim. You don't have to convert. You already are a Muslim. It's a quality that you are trying to dominate, but I will not, sir. No, no. I'm just trying to tell you, if you do not do idol worship, yeah. if you don't believe in God, yeah. and if you believe Prophet Muhammad's message, you are already a Muslim. You don't have to convert in public. To become a Muslim, you don't have to give shahada in front of public. It's between you and Allah. You don't have to tell me also. You don't that's have to tell me also. That's why I told you that I respect a lot Islam. So that's so in but, this way, but this way, but doesn't this means that ki, I don't respect my religion. My my word is ki, I have only one question. I am not doing idol worshiping. I believe in one God. I am not believing in any more any murtis and all that because I am inspired from the movie Oh My God. Because before that also I was going to the temples. Lots of people were doing in Shiv temple, uh, just putting the milk on the. Shivling and all that. I was not doing all that because I believe that it's it's totally waste of milk and the people are doing wrong things. Wrong Correct. Correct. So according to me, according to me, you're a Muslim if you don't believe in if you don't believe in idol worship, if you don't believe in murti puja, if you believe putting milk on the statue is wrong, if you believe in one God, if you believe Prophet Muhammad. According to me, you're already a Muslim. You don't have to say in public. You don't have to say in public, and the chances of you going to Jannah are very high. Not only do righteous deed, inshallah, you go to Jannah. Inshallah. No, because my friends told if you are not practicing Muslim practices like namaz and all that, so you will not go to Jannah. Ah, now if you practice less, the chances are less. But 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 as as mentioned in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter four, verse forty-eight. Surah Nisa, chapter four, one hundred and sixteen. If Allah, if if Allah pleases, He may forgive all your other sins. If he, I don't know, Allah, Allah. But chances are less, but there are chances. Thank you so much. If you believe there is one God, if you believe Prophet Muhammad is the messenger, and if you don't pray, chances are very less, but there are chances. If Allah forgives you that you have not prayed, but Allah believes that you believe in one God, and you believe in Prophet Muhammad, so chances are there. So your friend may not be knowing about the other aspect. But if you start praying, if you start fasting, the chances are more. If Allah gets pleased with you and forgive your sins, He may put you in Jannah. For that, I am not, for that I am not to convert my my religion into a Muslim. It's not the question of convert. According to me, you are already a Muslim. <laughs> but you are not a practicing Muslim. According to me, you are a Muslim, but you aren't a practicing Muslim. You are not a practicing Muslim. I pray to Allah to give you guidance to become a practicing Muslim. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, the most welcome. Before we, before we go to the next question, we may take a general announcement that all of you received registration cards when you came in. 
We'd like to stress if you can all fill those in and give them on the exit because you'll have the chance to be entered into the prize draws that are coming over the next few days. And also before we go to the next question, we have somebody who wants to accept Islam here tonight. from Russia, his name is Mikhail, and he wants to accept Islam, correct? Do you believe there's one God? Yes. Uh, do you believe Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God? Yes. MashaAllah. So I'll just say in Arabic and you can repeat inshallah. Is anyone forcing you to accept Islam? Is anyone forcing you to accept Islam? You're doing out of your own free will. MashaAllah. Brother is doing out of their own free will. I say in Arabic and you can repeat it. You can come close. Ashadu. Ashadu. Allah. Allah, ilaha, 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 illallah, illallah, wa ashadu, wa ashadu, anna, anna, muhammadan, muhammadan, abduhu, abduhu, wa rasulhu. I bear witness, I bear witness, I bear witness, I bear witness, that, that, that there is no God but Allah, uh, there is no God but Allah, and Prophet Muhammad, and Prophet Muhammad, is the servant, uh, is the servant, is the servant and, and messenger of Allah. And messenger of Allah. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, that may He grant Jannah to our new Muslim, a revert. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may He give this guidance to His other non Muslim friends and His family members so that when they come to the straight path. Can, Can we have the next question? question? The brother is a Muslim, so I think there is no Muslim there. Do we have a non-Muslim? Sister, sister, sister side. Any sister? Any, Any sister, sister of the non-Muslim? Any, Any sister, sister from the non-Muslim yes. side? Yes, doctor. Yes. yes, sister. Most welcome. Hello, sir. My name is Lolita, and this is something related to Bible. So in Bible it is written we should not worship idols. Then why in Roman Catholic Church we have Jesus and all saints, Mary's idols and uh, is it right worshipping them? Because as per Bible we shouldn't worship it. So what we are doing is it right according to Bible? Sister has asked a very good question. What she is referring to is the verse of the Bible in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 5, verse number 7, and the book of Exodus, chapter number 20, verse number 3 to 5, it says, Thou shall have no other image besides Thou shall have no other God besides me. Thou shall not make unto thee any image of any graven image of anything, of any likeness in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, in the water beneath the earth. Thou shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, thy God, thy Lord, is a jealous God. So according to the Bible, Old Testament as well as the New Testament, you should not make any image of Almighty God. You should not make any images. So your question is right, sister, that then why do the Roman Catholics make images? That's what you are perfectly right, sister. Making images of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, or of Mother Mary, or of any other saint, is totally prohibited according to the Bible. That is the reason the Protestants, they don't make any idol of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. So making images is wrong, sister. So you should put this question to the Catholics. So I have Catholic. already, uh, you know, checked with the priest, but I did not get a convincing answer. So what they are doing is wrong, sister. Uh, they are saying that just uh, to have a concentration, we have those ideals. So what is the difference between concentration and faith then? That's right. That's perfect. That's, perfect. that's the reason that's what the Hindus also say. They say that if you reach higher consciousness, then idol is not required for concentration. If that's the question, if that's the reason, then we Muslims have already reached that higher consciousness. So sister, do you believe in one God? Uh, yes, I do believe. Do you, do you believe Jesus is God? Uh, Jesus is not God. It's not written anywhere. He is just the son of God. Son of a messenger God of God? Is, no one knows who is God. He is yet to come. That's what I believe. No, you believe that Jesus is messenger of God? Uh, yes, right. Okay. So you believe God is yet to come. God doesn't come. God is already present, sister. Um, yet to come means, do you mean that God is not there? No, because there's a judgment day and... Uh, ah, correct. So on the judgment day, we will meet God. Uh, that, that's what. Ah, we'll meet God, but now in this life, 
will not meet God once we die and when we are resurrected on judgment we will meet him. So, so, but I heard that judgment day is near. It is not like after death there will be a judgment day. So it is something like we never know when is the judgment day. It is very near. No sister. The judgment day will only come even according to the Quran, according to the Bible. Only after you die and after you are resurrected. If the judgment day takes now, what about those people who have died? How will they attend the judgment day sister? Uh, no, I am no, sure asking suppose judgment day comes today. What about the people who have died thousand years back? So they already have their judgment day. No, that is wrong sister. The, the thing, the teaching of Islam is that once you die, you are dormant, you are in barzakh. It's an interim life. On the day of judgment, all the human beings from Adam and Islam, till the last day will be resurrected. They will be again given life. And once the life is given, then the judgment will take place and based on your good deeds and bad deeds, then depending upon you go to heaven and his sister. Hope you understand. Yes, so what you're saying is this ideal worship, what we are doing in Roman Catholic Church is completely wrong, right? Completely wrong according to the Bible, according to the Quran also. But um, is there any way that we can give them a convincing answer, like priest or anyone? No, the answer that I have given, I have quoted to you from the Bible system. Yeah, right, but uh, how and can I've quoted I you from the, them? So you tell them if they don't believe, so they are at fault, they will suffer, not you. Okay. Our job is to tell, I'm telling the Christian. Many Christians come to the state path, many Many Christians who worship Jesus Christ as God, then they stop worshipping and they come on the state. But many Christians even accept Islam. Alhamdulillah. So our job is to tell, we cannot force anyone, sister. So if they get convinced, good. If they don't get convinced, you pray for them, sister. All right. Thank you. Sister, I am asking you, do you believe uh, uh, Prophet uh, uh, Muhammad? Yeah. Do you believe that he is the messenger of God? Uh, yes, I do believe. Do you believe there is one God? I do believe that. And you believe Jesus is also a messenger of God? All right. Then you are a Muslim sister. So what you are saying sister... Even I do the fasting for 27th day, so I will follow that. Mashallah, mashallah. So sister, according to me, you are a Muslim then? Uh, yes. So would you like to say the Shahada? In Arabic, would you like to say that? What I asked you in English? I asked you in English, do you believe in one God? You said yes. I, I do believe, but... Um, so if you believe in one God, you said but yes. But I need, I need to learn some more. That's why I need No, to learning is secondary, sister. No, first, you have to, first you have to take admission in the school, then you have to learn. You cannot say, I will... I will first learn and then take admission in school. First you take admission, you fulfill the criteria of admission. Once you fulfill the criteria of admission, you join the school and you learn. You cannot say that first I will learn and become a graduate and then join school, sister. No, because my roommate, she is a Muslim and she has told me she'll give me a Quran. So I That's fine. Don't, that. don't wait. It's not necessary. You have to get the Quran and then become a Muslim. According to me, you're already a Muslim. If you say the Shahada, you will become practicing slowly, slowly. Once you say the Shahada, what I already said in English, once you say in Arabic, it will give you more power, inshallah, to practice Islam. Who would you like to say in Arabic, sister? Uh, not now. So when you say it? No, according to me, you already said it. According to me, when yeah, I ask as you in you, English, as you already disclosed, uh, in you English already you have said it. Yeah, as you Even if you say in English, you become a Muslim. You don't have to say it in Arabic, sister. Yeah, as you already said, it is not required to say in front of anyone. So, yes. I, and it's me and between the God. Yes, yes I'm understood, sister. Jazakallah, may Allah give you more hidayah, and may Allah give you opportunity to give hidayah to your other non-Muslim friends, sister. Thank you, sir. Jazakallah, sister. We have a yes. Please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Uh, my name is Ram. I work for a bank here, and uh, I have some couple of questions which you answered already. But I want to, I want to just want to have a reiterate of uh, what you have told to, to, to us. It's like uh, we have a lot of uh, I'm, a, I'm a Hindu within this, of course. So uh, I have been uh, come across Vedas, not read actually. I know that there are four Vedas, a lot of Upanishads, a lot of uh, uh, Mahabharat, Bhagavatam, and all those things in our religion. In Islam, we have Quran. In Christianity, we have uh, Bible. And I just want to uh, make it up on this subject, actually, where uh, you say it is compatible. The Quran is compatible with the scientific, uh, modern scientific uh, methodology. But I just want to know which book will be more compatible or more precise. Uh, as you told, it, the old books which have already been uh, covered for the last or the last generation or previous generations. But since those uh, Vedas and all those Upanishads are very vast, it would have been covered and a lot of things. And the Quran may be the precise one of that. Or Bible may be more precise of that. 
so according to the you no know, the written uh, periods so how do you say that sir uh, what 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 will be your uh, suggestion on that there are other questions and all the other scriptures the bible and the vedas the upanishads are they are they scientific or not they are more vast correct that's right so when you come to the vastness how have they become vast for example you have mentioned mahabharata so mahabharata originally it was a story told by the grandson of arjun it contain 8000 shlokas how many 8000 today the mahabharata contains more than 100000 shlokas where did it come from interpolation addition okay if you see mahabharata on the television you know mahabharata yes sir television serial yes there is some maruti ka in the background how did maruti ka come in mahabharata okay so these are additions okay addition so as additions keep on coming it cannot be the word of god okay so that is the reason it has become voluminous because of additions yes sir so therefore if you if you put science as a test as a yardstick all the other scriptures whether it be the bible whether it be mahabharata whether it be they fail the test there are many unscientific things mentioned in the bible many unscientific things mentioned in the vedas in the mahabharata how can you assume the word of god even if you say it was that maybe it was even if it was it has changed and even if it was the word of god it was meant for those people for that time today you have to follow the last and final revelation the glorious quran because it was not only revealed for the muslims or the arab it was revealed for the whole of human kind and if you put it to the test of science this quran passes the test hope that answers the question sir that's fine sir but uh, the knowledge which provided by the our vedas has already been given knowledge for the people who are been there the previous previous generations that's right so uh, they will be it's their duty to take it up whether you have or if you have a old old model new model which will you prefer the new model or the old model of course new model has been come because of the old model was ah, only old model is gone old model may have mistakes from old model we have taken the new model correct but, but yes. the old model may have mistakes also na old that's model right. may be wrong also but uh, right, so the old model may be right may be wrong correct it's not that it has to be right so when you have the latest model the quran without any mistakes without any flaw you have to follow the latest model which we did not know we followed no problem so now when you have come to know yesterday we did not know about science we believe world was flat we believed it no problem but today you will say because my father believe the world is flat will you believe the world is flat no you respect your father that's right you respect him but you don't believe him yes correct yes the same way you respect no problem but you have to believe in the quran which is impeccable which is proved scientifically it's a miracle of miracles we prove it self to the word of god in the last day of judgment hope that answers the question that's right sir and, and small privilege to be here for, in front of you and thanks a lot for the uh, management for this thanks. brother do you believe in one god i believe in god one god or many gods i believe in god that's it i don't know it's one or many no, no. but it's it is everywhere believe in god, god is everywhere god or gods God, god is everywhere so you believe in god or do you believe in god 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 no one god yes in english god means one can't be two that's right if it two becomes god so one god or god is same thing yes do you one god yes do you believe in idol worship do you say you are a vedantist i do but do you say you are a vedantist how do you believe in idol worship if you are this is a hindu right main no vedantist actual vedantist is fun to follow the vedas Okay. It's mentioned in Yajurveda, chapter number thirty-two, verse number three. Na tasya pratima asti. Of that God, there is no pratima. Pratima means image, photograph, picture, painting. Of that God, there is no pratima. There is no image. There is no photograph. There is no painting. There is no picture. There is no sculpture. There is no statue. There is no idol. How come you are calling yourself a Vedantist? You are not a Vedantist. You are a pseudo Vedantist. But I believe we have read your Veda. that means you have you rightly said you have not read your veda go home and read your veda that's right. and see my video cassette similarities between islam and hinduism sure sir and there i have quoted the veda that veda is against idol worship okay you should stop idol worship believe in one god stop idol worship and believe in the true god okay. and also your veda say about the last and final messenger to come prophet muhammad so read the vedas hear my hear my video cassette similarities with islam and hinduism and inshallah allah will guide you the truth part as yes, one more question if you don't mind so you said it is more compatible the quran is more compatible for scientific world so why don't the scientist study the quran and do their innovations or have a good very good very good very good question if quran is compatible with science why don't the scientist study the quran and do it that's what they're doing 
That's what Keith Moore did. Keith Moore did that, na? Okay. When he found out from the Quran, he wrote a new book, a new edition. He got an award for the best medical book written by a single author. He did it. There are many people doing. Some understand, some don't understand. You have to keep on reading, reading. As you keep on reading, you understand better. As science advances, you better understand the Quran better. And there are yet many things in the Quran which science hasn't discovered yet. So you have to do more research on the Quran so that you'll understand science better. Hope that answers the question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Do we have any non-Muslims? Okay, we'll take another one. Good evening. My name is Sean, and by profession, I'm an accountant. Uh, I had a different I'm sorry, question. I'm sorry. Please give a chance to the, uh, the other microphone. We'll come back to you, brother. Are there non-Muslims on this microphone? You're Muslim. Non-Muslim, non-Muslim. No, no. Uh, among the sisters? And he said, I thought there were about six, seven sisters left for non-Muslims. A non-Muslim sister who had a question? Question. Yes, yes, sister, you're most welcome. If uh, Muslim people say that Christians are from Ahl al-Quran and they have four books, Zabur, Injil, Quran, and Torah, then why they only read one Quran? Why not first three books? Sister, that's a very good question. Uh, sister, are you a Christian? No, no, no. I am Emirati, but I'm asking the question on behalf of someone else. Okay. So, sister is asking a question on behalf of somebody else in Emirati. Emirati but a Muslim, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Muslim. Because Emirati are non-Muslim or something. No, 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 Muslim. <laughs> but from my accent, I could make out, sister. Our sister asked the question that if Muslims believe that there are four revelations, Torah, Zabur, Injil, and the Quran, why do they only read the Quran? Why don't they read the other three? As I said earlier, sister, that by name, there are four revelations mentioned in the Quran. Torah, Zabur, Injil, and the Quran. Torah is the Wahi, the revelation given to... Moses, peace be upon him. Zabur is the wahi, the revelation given to David, peace be upon him. Injil is the wahi, the revelation given to Jesus, peace be upon him. And Quran is the last and final revelation given to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But there were other revelations also, as I mentioned earlier in my answer, in Surah Raj chapter 13, verse 38, that there were other revelations given earlier, also like Sufa, Ibrahim, etc. But, sister, as I was telling to the brother earlier, that we have to follow the last and final revelation, that is the updated one. And the last and final revelation is the Quran. All the other revelations that came before, they have not been preserved in the authentic form, sister. They have been changed by the passage of time. As the Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 79, that woe to those who write the book with their own hand. And then traffic is for miserable price. Woe to those for what they earn, woe to those for what they write. So here the Quran says that all the earlier scriptures have been changed and all the earlier scriptures that came before the Quran, they were meant for a particular group of people and was meant to be followed in a particular time period till the new revelation came. So all the revelation that came were meant only for those people. Like the, the Quran says that Isa a.s. was only sent for Bani Israel. The Bible says that Jesus Christ peace be upon was only sent for the Jews. So today, because Quran is the last and final revelation, it was not sent only for a particular group of people, it was not sent only for the Muslims or the Arabs, it was sent for the whole of humanity. So today, irrespective whether you're living in India or in UAE or in Saudi Arabia or in Pakistan or in USA, you have to follow the last and final revelation the Quran and the last and final revelation of Muhammad. Why do we read only the Quran? The other scriptures you can read for academic purposes or for doing dawah. But for Hidayah, Quran is sufficient, it is the last model. As I told you, that if there's an old model and a new model, you'll follow the new model. This is the updated model, after this no new model will come. It is the last revelation, after this no new revelation will come. That is the reason Muslims only read the Quran. You can read the other scriptures for doing dawah or for getting the others closer to Islam. But for Hidayah, only Quran is sufficient. Hope that answers the question, sister. Yes, brother. Yes, sir. I had a different question for you before, but I was standing back there and around four times like you have said that Bible is actually like if you test it, it will be proven wrong. Now I have a very general question. What's your name and your oh, profession? My name is Sean. Yes. And by profession I'm an accountant. I have a very general question for you. Let's suppose, like I'm a Christian, let's suppose Bible is wrong. For the sake of an argument, Bible is wrong. Right? My beliefs are wrong. Now, why do I find that Muslims in particular, 
have to degrade other religions just to feel superior. Why is that? I may be wrong, but that's what the perception is. What I learn or what I see, this is what I see. Brothers ask the question that if he's following Bible and you assume Bible is wrong, why should Muslim degrade the non-Muslims? And it's a very good question. We are not allowed to insult a non-Muslim. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Anam chapter 6 verse 108, Revile not those who they worship God besides Allah, lest in their ignorance they will revile Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are not supposed to insult or degrade any other God which they are worshipping. It's prohibited. You just Bible four times. Sorry? You just did Bible four times. Eh? You did Bible four times. You proved Bible four times that Bible is wrong. Ah. He's saying I proved Bible. I'm not insulting no. if it is. Okay. Whether 2 plus 3 is equal to 5. Is it correct? Yes, sir. 2 plus 3 is equal to 5. Is it correct? No. Was it? Correct or wrong? Wrong. Oh, so you're insulting me now. Are you insulting me? Are you, are you insulting me? Are you insulting me? What? Are you insulting me by saying 2 plus 3 is equal to 5 is wrong? I'm not insulting you. I'm telling you it's wrong. All right. Very good. Same thing I'm telling. Where am I insulting? I'm only telling it is wrong. When I say 2 plus 3 is equal to 5, you're telling I'm wrong. You're saying you're insulting me. Same way I'm not insulting the Bible. I'm telling the Bible is wrong. If Bible says, in the, if the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 16, light of the moon is its own light. It is wrong. What is wrong? I have to say it's wrong. But I'm not insulting. Am I insulting? Yes, of course. You are feeling insulted. No. no because you feel saying, right. Why is it that it has to be that way? No, two you plus are... two is not five. We understand that. So it is wrong, man. Bible is the word of God, and if I am, if I am the, the word of God according to you, not according to me. Exactly. So, so if, if you believe God can make a mistake, it's your problem, not my problem. God has not made a mistake, and He will never Correct. Be. Correct. God has not made a mistake. That is the reason Bible is not the word of God. And I'm proving to you that Bible says in the book of Genesis, chapter number one, verse number sixteen, Almighty God made two lights: the greater light, the sun, to rule the day. The lesser light, the moon to rule the night. So Bible says light of the moon is own light. Now in science and Quran, it says light of the moon is not its own light. Light of the moon is not its own light. But, but the Bible says specifically says that the light of the moon. Light of the moon is reflected. That is what the Quran says. Bible says own light. Genesis chapter one verse sixteen. Have you read it? I haven't read it. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Almighty God created two lights. The greater light and the smaller light. It's meaning a light of its own. So if Bible made a mistake, it made a mistake. I'm not insulting the Bible. I'm telling you like how you told me I'm wrong. So I feel insulted. I feel insulted. Correct. Why did you say I'm wrong? But it is wrong on me to feel insulted. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. It will be foolish for me to argue and say no, no, you know. Just because you're saying I'm wrong, I'm insulted. You are giving me, you are trying to help me out. Correct? You are trying to help me out or not? Yes. The same way I'm trying to help you, brother. <laughs> no, sir. The same way insulting any other religion is haram in Islam. You cannot insult, you cannot degrade. But if you mention a fact, a fact is a fact. Hope that answers the question. Do we have any more non Muslims on the ladies' side? Six. Six. I, I, I believe that there's a lady who wants to become a Muslim, is that correct? Not yet. Not yet, okay. So if we can take one from the sister side now. Sure. Um, good evening. Um, actually, this is in connection with the first gentleman who asked the question regarding the uh, marrying one or more. So, is there verses in the Quran that God give a reason? Why, he, as you stated, that um, women, God, uh, God made women more than men. So is there verses in the Quran that stated the reason why God created women more than men? Krishna asked the question that, as far as the first question posed, that you can marry more than one wife, and the reason I give, Quran doesn't say that, that women are more. So does Quran give the reason why God created more women? By nature, men and women are born in equal proportion, sister, by nature. But by nature, the female sex is stronger. Medically, the female sex is stronger than the male sex. In the pediatric age itself, when you ask any child doctor, he will tell you that 
the female child can fight the germs and diseases much better than the male child. So there are more deaths in the male children as compared to female children. As life goes on, the death due to cigarette smoking, due to alcoholism, due to war, due to accidents, there are more male dying as compared to female. That is the reason the female population is more as compared to male population. And the female longevity, the age, they live longer than men. So God created that way. God created female stronger than men. So we should be crying, not you. So, so sister, this is male by nature. They are born in equal proportion, but the female sex is stronger in terms of living as compared to male. So because of this, because God has made the female sex stronger than male in living, that is the reason God has given permission for man to have more than one wife, and God has made man more sexual as compared to female. So this is the makeup of God because he made female stronger and male less stronger and, fe and fe male per se are more sexual as compared to female. That is the reason he's given permission for some men to have more than one wife. Hope that answers the question, sister. I'm sorry. I have a next question, please. Uh, yeah, sister, we're running short of time. So if we allow only one question per sister, it's better, sister. We have one more question from the Jain side, non-Muslim. Because the time duration, I think only about 10 minutes are left. And we have to end the session by 1.30. So we'll allow only another three or four questions. Yes, brother. Hi, uh, my name is Bartha Sarthi from uh, India, working as an architect. Will the, uh, my question is, will there be any doubt about the greatness or um, the miracle of miracle about this book? or Islam. There is no doubt about the greatness or miracles, whatever it is. But your, your show was to prove again to reintrate the greatness. But is it the need of the day? We all know, I don't, I don't think even, uh, nobody will have any doubt even if they know little about Quran, uh, they, they won't have any doubt. But is it the need of the day? As I'm from India, the brother asked the question that no one doubts the greatness of the Quran, the miraculous of the Quran. So is it required to reiterate? Uh, no, I didn't finish it. Let me finish the question. So as I'm, as I'm from India, you know, we are, we are, we were like brothers and sisters in any religion people uh, and even until now uh, even though the news is coming out is very negligible what is happening out there they are not uh, giving the pro exact uh, exactly what is happening we are still uh, treating the mi minority uh, which is the other religion I'm from Hindu we are treating as brother brothers and sisters but where the, the sad, really sad, I'm feeling really sad. The, the sad part is where, where the people who has got such a book and such a religion, where these people following, the more, more Islam is followed in this region, where what is happening in this region, you know, the unrest and all, all these things happening, it is, it is not correlating with the quality of the book and what is happening. So something is wrong in between. So this re-rating is the need of the day. This is my question. Brother, that was a question that no one doubts the miraculous nature of the Quran, the goodness of the Quran. Is it required to reiterate? But what is he seeing in this part of the world? He's talking about the Arab world. That's so much of unrest, which is not correct. Brother, I disagree with you that everyone knows about Quran. Majority people know. I don't agree with you. Alhamdulillah. So even, see, even I don't know, but I know about Quran. See. You don't know, but you know. Yeah. That means you at least know the basics. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Yeah. But, but everyone doesn't know the basics. So these lectures are mainly kept to inform the others who don't know about it. And those who know little know more about it. You may have known about the Quran, but surely you might have learned something today. Yes or no? Surely learn. No? Fine. So these lectures are meant to reiterate and to give more knowledge to the non-Muslim as well as the Muslim. Many Muslims are unaware of the miraculous nature of the Quran. As far as your basic question is concerned, why is the unrest in the, in the, in the, in the Arab world? The reason is 
that the some people cannot see the growth of Islam. So because they cannot see the growth of Islam, they want to create the unrest in Islam. So when I, I don't agree. You don't agree. I'm giving you the. You don't have to agree. Okay. You don't have to agree. Okay. You ask me the question. I'm giving you the reason. You haven't heard my full answer. You say don't agree. No. Did I complete my answer? Okay, finish. Did I complete or no? No. No, so how can you say don't agree? Okay. That means you have a prejudice mind. Whatever Zakir says, I will say no. So you are calling me the brother, I am calling you my brother. So why are you treating your brother like that? Okay, okay, continue. Let, let, let me, I didn't start only your saying you don't agree. See, I am a good brother to you. Huh? So what happened that because the growth of Islam is there, I believe when they talk about the Western world, talking on war, war for peace, war for peace, you know, after 9 there war for peace. It's not war for peace, it's war on peace. Islam comes from the root word salam meaning peace. So another word for Islam is peace. So it's not war for peace, it is war on peace. And all these things that you do, I've given a talk on, is terrorism a Muslim monopoly? And I've proved there, that most of the terrorist act done in the past were done by non Muslims, not by Muslims. But today the media portrays Muslims and they're targeting Muslims and they're creating this fitna. And we Muslims, it's our fault, we are also getting engulfed in this. We should be aware of the strategy and we should see to it that the Muslims should be united. Quran says in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 103, Hold to the war for Allah strong and be not divided. If we Muslims are united, and, and we are not divided, we will be a strong power. And we should go close to Quran and Sunnah. We have gone away from Quran and Sunnah, that is the reason we are suffering today. We aren't united, therefore we are suffering today. What's happening? Unrest, it is created by the people who are addressed. The people who are addressed, they fear the spread of Islam. According to me, and you see my video cassette, media and Islam war of peace. And it is the monopoly. I have discussed this in detail, and according to me, it is more of these superpowers who don't want Islam to spread. That's the reason they're trying the level best to create more unrest in the Muslim areas so that they don't want this religion to spread. Hope that answers the question. No. Uh, so you mean to say the counteract uh, given by the Muslim people are correct? To me, it is not correct. There should be some other peaceful way we need to find out. Your question was why is the unrest? You didn't say who is counteracting. Now I'm asking a new question. No, don't ask a new question. You ask me why there's unrest, I give the reason. Now you're asking a new question that why is the counteraction of the Muslim? That's the new question, correct? Is it the same question or new question? It is, it is, uh, it is all together. No, but the, was this part of your first question? No. No, it's at the end of the day. Not end of the day, I'm going starting of the day. Okay. First go to the starting of the day. That did you ask the question about counteracting? No. You ask a simple question, why is there unrest in the Arab country? I gave the answer. Now you're asking a new question. A new question whether they are already running short of time. So the question is very, time is limited. We have to give time to the sisters. Okay, I understand. Brother, you ask one question, I give you the answer. Now we give chance to the sisters and time is short. Afterwards, inshallah, we can give you more time. Yes, sister, most welcome, sister. Yes, sir. Hello, good evening, uh, Mr. Uh, Sakir Naik. Uh, my name is JJ, and I'm a marketing manager in profession. I just want to ask you some specific question regarding the crucifixion of Jesus. According to the Quran, Jesus is crucified, and according to the Bible, uh, he died in the cross along with the two thieves. And then how the story form from the Bible, and what happened to the two criminals which Jesus promised that he will bring them to, par to the paradise. And also, uh, who is the one, who is the man who is crucified along with the two thieves? This is the question that according to the Quran, Jesus Christ peace was not crucified. According to the Bible, he was crucified along with two thieves. And what happened to the two thieves? So that I have to ask the Christian, not to me, sister. As far as the Bible says, the Bible is very clear in the Quran. And, uh, as far as the Quran is concerned, Quran is clear in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, 157. The Quran says that they said in boast, for calling him, that they killed Jesus, the son of Mary. They killed him, not Jesus, the crucifixion. Malakin should be alone. It was only made to appear so. 
All those who differ are full of doubts, illati bazan, with only conjecture to follow. For yakinan, for yakinan, they did not kill him. So the Bible says Jesus Christ, peace, I mean, sorry, the Quran says that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not killed, was not crucified. It was only made to appear so. How it happened, Allah wa'ala. So the Quran is very clear that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not killed, he was not crucified. And if we do a study of the Bible, even according to my study of the Bible, Jesus Christ was not crucified. Crucified by definition means a person who's put on the cross and he dies on the cross. If he does not die on the cross, it's not called crucified. So according to the Bible, he was put on the cross, but according to my evidence, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did not die on the cross. And for this, I give a strong evidence that if you read the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was asked that, O oh Lord, O oh Master, show us signs and miracles. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, replies, but no sign and ministry can be shown to you except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And if you know the sign of Jonah, sister, the, the, the book of Jonah, which is hardly two signs in the Bible, it says that Prophet Jonah, he was asked by Almighty God to go to Nineveh. But he does not obey Almighty God and he goes to Joppa. Now while he's trying to Joppa in a boat, in a ship, there's a storm that comes. And there was a superstition of that time that the storm that comes is due to someone disobeying the master. So they take out lots to find out who is the person who disobeyed the master. Uh, prophet Jonah, being the prophet of God, he volunteers and says, I'm the person who's running away from the master. So they want to throw him overboard. So when they throw Jonah overboard, sister, I want to ask you, was Jonah dead or alive? Sister, do you know the sign of Jonah? Sister, you're a Christian, huh? Hello, uh, sorry, the mic is not with me, that's why. Yeah, yeah of course, it's alive. You're, you're alive. alive. So, so no, a normal person is here alive. No, if, when a person is thrown in a raging storm, he ought to die. When he's thrown in the sea, when he enters the sea, was Jonah dead alive? Yeah, he's alive. Alive. Later on, a fish comes and gobbles him up. When a fish gobbles a man up, a man ought to die. Was Jonah dead or alive? Alive. alive. So miracle of a miracle, thrown overboard, alive, a fish comes and gobbles, alive. For three days and three nights, according to the Bible, he was in the belly of the fish. For three days and three nights, when he prayed to Almighty God, was he dead or alive? Yeah, he's alive. For three days and three nights, a man ought to suffocate and die of suffocation. He's alive. Alive, alive, alive. When the fish gobbles him out, was Jonah dead or alive? Alive. alive, 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 alive. Miracle of a miracle of a miracle of a miracle. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, puts all his eggs in one basket and says, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, after he was removed from the cross and put in the sepulcher, was he dead or alive? He's dead. According to the Bible. According to the Bible. According to your understanding of the Bible. The Bible doesn't say he was dead. The Bible says he was put in the sepulchre. Now, that means Jesus Christ told a lie. No, Uzbillah. Did, did Jesus tell a lie? That means. Peace be upon him. He said, as Jonah was three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights. If Jonah was alive, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, has to be? Has to be? Alive or dead, sister? Has to be alive. Alive, so that means he was alive. The so Bible also says he was alive. And who is the one who is crucified on the cross? Along with the two No, he was crucified according to me. He did not die. Crucified means someone who dies on the cross. So if you read the Bible, he was put on the cross. On the cross he prays, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabakhtani. Oh God, oh God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was put on the cross, but because it was a Sabbath day, and it was... He, when he was crucified on Friday, before Sabbath, before Saturday, it was the teachings of that time of the Jews that no one can be crucified on a Saturday. So before Saturday comes, they brought Jesus Christ from the cross, brought him down early. So according to me, he did not die on the cross, he was alive. Do you understand, sister? So according to my understanding of the Bible, because it was a Saturday, Sabbath day, the soldiers brought him down early and they put him in the grave. But in the grave, the grave as you read in the Bible was a, was a big room. He was alive. And after that, the next day, 
on Sunday morning, you find that the stone was removed. Who moved the stone? And the grave was empty. How did the grave become empty? Huh? So that means Jesus Christ's peace grave was alive. And after he was treated, the wound was treated, he walked away from the grave. Sorry? He didn't die. He did not die. So yes, that, according to the Bible, he died. No, according and to the Bible, he came alive. no, that's what. Uh, that's your understanding, sister. So that means so if he, no, no, if he died, that means Jesus Christ told a lie. Peace be upon him. He said, as Jonah was three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights. So was Jonah dead or alive? Sister, was Jonah dead or alive in the belly of the fish? Yeah, he's alive, but uh, he didn't when die. Jonah was alive, uh, according to the Bible, Jonah didn't die. No, so do you believe in Jesus okay. Christ? Was Jesus according Christ? According to the Bible, Jesus died. That, that means there's a contradiction in the Bible. That means there's a contradiction in the Bible. That means Jesus told a lie. No, Zubillah. How can Jesus Christ tell a lie? Jesus Christ did not tell a lie. Jesus Christ, peace be upon alive. So if you hear my tape, if you hear my full cassette, on was Christ crucified? It's the debate I had. In that you get more details. So therefore, if you have to prove that Jesus is a truthful person, you have to believe that Jesus Christ, peace be upon did not die. It was not crucifixion. It was crucifixion. It's not F I X I O N, it is F I C T I O N. So Jesus Christ, peace be did not die. He was put on the cross, he was removed, he was alive. That's the same thing when he comes in the upper room. And if you read Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24, verse number 36, he tells to the apostles, Shalom alaikum. Peace be on him. Then Thomas says that I will not believe unto you until I touch you. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, A spirit has no flesh and bones. Correct? To touch and see me, I have flesh and bones. So if Jesus was resurrected, he should be a spirit, not flesh and bone. So this proves that Jesus Christ, peace be upon, did not die. He was wounded, he was treated, and he went and met the apostles. Hope that answers the question, sister. With uh, this question, we will end today's proceedings. We'd like to remind you all that on Monday the 22nd and Tuesday the 23rd, when there will be Arabic lectures, we will have a simultaneous English audio translation so you can all attend and of course the more you attend the more you have the chances to win uh, we'd also like to announce that we have on the exit as you leave on the right on the men's side we have a section called Kundai where you can collect uh, bags in different languages like English, Tagalog, Malayalam and Hindi which can be given to non-Muslims if yourself is, are a non-Muslim please take away one of these bags. You'll also find the same section, the ladies section on the right hand side towards the middle. And also we have some health awareness sections where you are free to get various medical tests. Hijri, 12th to 23rd of July 2013 in Zabil Hall at the Dubai World Trade Center. By the grace of God Almighty, Dubai became a tourist destination by people from around the world because it embodies originality, modernity, and sophistication whilst maintaining Islamic values, traditions, and heritage. Ramadan Forum, organized by the Department of Tourism and